Good, good morning. I'm pretty sure it's still morning everywhere. It's afternoon here for me. I hope you can hear me well. Yeah, good morning. Yes, yeah, good morning. Good morning. I can hear you well. All right. Uh, nice to hear all of you. I can't see you, but it's fine. I'll also switch off my video so that we standardize the process. But uh, I thought I'd show my face first so that you know who is speaking to you. I'm excited to take you through the first course on introduction to data science. It's really uh, top level. And I think if we want to get to know more about data science, we can take this further. But today's course is to take you very quickly through um, the what to know about data science as you start on this interesting five weeks journey. So thank you, mm -hmm. uh, for the invite. And I hope that after three hours or less today, we should be at a better position with regards to data science. I know most of you might have already uh, know, have some knowledge about data science. So if there's a repetition on your end, please uh, apologies for that, but feel free to stop me and, and ask any questions. So I will start to share my screen. It's like a, like uh, Kofi has said, um, I currently lead the data science program from the African Population and Health Research Center. This is situated in Nairobi. So yes, so the APHRC is a Pan-African institution that's based in Nairobi. We, we do a lot of work around um, population dynamics, health and well-being, education, and lots of other programs. So the data science unit is actually a young unit as well. It's only about two years, coming one and a half years, and we are looking forward to building the journey with many other persons in Africa. Not that they, we are the experts, but just to learn and share our experiences with uh, data-driven uh, professionals in Africa. So for this session, I'll take you very briefly through introduction to data science, and uh, we'll talk about some of the data sources, what is data science, some use cases, and uh, what's the data life cycle, some skill sets that one needs to have, what are the job roles out there, and a few conclusions around um, what from, from the one and a half time that we spent in this session. So as a brief to introduction and resources, we know that there's been an evolution of technology everywhere. I think if you look back 20 years, every single day, there is a, a lot of advancement in technology. We started off with telephones and now we're looking at smartphones. A lot of data that is coming in from our contacts, from the images, from the games we, we, we play, from the videos that we watch on all these smartphones. And even for the non-smartphones, there's a lot of information collected from the, from the telephone conversations, the voice recordings, the SMSs. All this is information that is becoming very, very usable. And we've seen storage coming in from floppy disks. I think all of you are very young, but if you're as old as I am, you can remember we used to use floppy disks. And then uh, now we talk about cloud, cloud storage. There's a lot of data coming in from social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And every day this data generates uh, vast amount, these, these, these different streams generate vast amounts of data. Every second, literally, there's something that is being added to the uh, available data, including images, voice, all kinds of encrypted files. And it cannot be stopped anymore. I think somebody once said data is a new oil. We have to work with what we have, protect it to the best of our ability, but just to know that there's a lot of um, data being generated that it's now time for people like you on the continent to harness this data, know what tools to use. And I think this course is going to be very fundamental in shaping the next level of um, data, data professionals and actors in Africa. So in terms of uh, new, new what's, what's, what's emerging in new technology, we are seeing storage and tons of bytes of data that are generated daily. We start off with megabytes and bytes, but now we're talking of really trillions of data that are generated every day. 
the Internet of Things, which like we talked about earlier, it's a network of devices that communicate and transfer data from the cars to the TV, coffee machines, the voice, the chatbots, everything is generating data. And of course, artificial intelligence now comes into play, the ability for machines to perform tasks that were commonly associated with human intelligence. But now with this data, teaching them where they can reason, if they can discover, if they can generalize, learn from the past. And that is what the whole uh, AI is, is really doing, of course, to some extent, and it's driven by humans. But this is fundamental to data science. And then there's a lot of other factors contributed to data generated every day. There are online transactions. When you go to your phone, you pay a bill or a at the supermarket, when you stream music, healthcare, the smartwatches that we wear, the Fitbits, the things we use to track our sleep, all these are generating data. If you do a course online, you log in, even this Zoom call itself is generating data. So there's a lot of data being generated and it's now the era to kind of see how we can harness this data for, for strategies that are going to improve our livelihood, inform strategy, inform the way health decisions are made and hopefully make us um, better humans. So I have a couple of questions here and I don't want, the, I don't want us to be very quiet and I'll just open the, you can open your mic and, and just share. What other ways do you think big data is generated in your respective, in your respective places or countries or day-to-day -day areas of work? Do you have any other uh, ways in which you think data are generated that I might have missed out? Anybody can open their mic and share. Okay, uh, Edem. Oh, okay, thank you. So in the healthcare setting or the hospital setting, data can also be generated through the outpatient, uh, the, uh, outpatient department. When they come in, the, the, the social demographics or the, the names and other, other information that are generated from them can also be a source of uh, data at the Correct. point of uh, entry at the hospital. Thank you. Thank you, Eden. So healthcare records, electronic healthcare records. And yes. Of, of, of data generated every day. Chisong. Uh, all right. Um, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Well, um, I think data is also generated hugely uh, from clinical research, like um, clinical trials, um, uh, studies that are being done, laboratory data every day in the lab. We show out uh, patient results, um, clinical tests here and there, especially in big tertiary hospitals. So, like, uh, there are some clinical trials we are currently doing. I know the huge amount of data we just generated from 300 patients. So, this has become really, really, the data has really become an issue. and. It has become a bit difficult to manage, especially in a very big hospital setting. So, Excellent. You. Yes, so research studies uh, also continue. They were kind of our traditional way that we used to collect data. You do your study, power it, design the clinical trial, go collect data. So they still remain a fundamental source of data. So I'm going to take two more. Lanka and William, and then we'll go to the next question. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, another way uh, big data can be generated is through ambulance um, uh, dispatch logs, uh, tracking all that information actually uh, generates uh, a lot of data on a day-to-day -day basis, oh. which then can be utilized to actually uh, uh, take note of uh, areas uh, affected by certain elements uh, that are being responded to by the ambulance services. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, okay. So like when the ambulance is picking casualties and dropping back patients, that's that's a lot of traffic data. That yes. Yes. In. Yes. So that's a good source. So you can see the different sources. So I'll take William and then Richmond, you go to the next question. 
Yes, please. We can also get data from um, uh, registration centers, like uh, where we register people at, at the point of birth, at the point of dying, and also maybe at the point of marriage, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Yes, so uh, that's like um, civil, uh, civil, civil registration, like death, birth, Exactly. Yes, civil registration. That's like the statistics that many countries continue to collect. So yes, and so there's a lot of data. So we can go to the next question. So Raven, is my is my screen still sharing? Okay, right. So what do you think? Here I'm not talking sharing. about. Is no, it not Sorry, yes, your screen is not sharing. not sharing. It's not. Oh, because I I decided to look at the chat to see sorry about that i wanted to see who was um who was okay i have lost my screen who was putting up their hands so i out of this screen okay so why are businesses and i think this is businesses but it can be anything it can be healthcare it can be institutions why do you think if they use big data they have a competitive advantage compared to a business that is not data-driven. And here, again, just feel free to open the mic I, and we can talk about it again. So some companies are now really getting data-driven. Some people still hold their data, but do you think there is an advantage if, uh, a competitive advantage if companies that, with companies that use data? Yes, ma'am. Uh, can I talk? Um, yes, please go ahead. All right, all right. Well, um, from my practical experience, companies and businesses that actually store data, analyze it, make decisions based on data, have more competitive advantage because they get to know, understand the customers experience with their product they get to know the market what the market is saying they get to understand what people are the reaction of the customer uh -huh. so because at the end of the day if you are providing a service and the people you are providing the service to are not satisfied they may not come back so when you call Is it you actually so, okay. can make predictions? Okay. That's fine. Yes. So you can drive more decisions from data. And there's a lot of activity in the chat. Businesses use data for decision making. They get to know customers' preference and experience. That's like customer profiling. You can actually use it for risk. Uh, banks are now using uh, big data to say, oh, this person is at risk of defaulting a lot, or they are very good customers, or their credit is high based on their transactions. So there's a lot of advantages. But what do you think are the challenges with some of this big data? You know, I thought I was putting the top post. Can you mute, please? If you're not. Kevin, can you help mute um, who is not talking? I don't know whether he's still in the call. Difficulties in storing, there's privacy. Yes, uh, there's a lot of challenges with big data. Yes, somebody can hack into this data. There's a lot of uh, issues around protection, data protection, if you don't use the data well or for the purpose that it's been used for, again, it can be, you know, it can turn for the worse when you're using a lot of big data. But let's uh, let's go on in the interest of time. And uh, yes, so in fact, this, this came out, I think just last week. I don't know how many of of you have, have used Alexa. It's kind of like um, a Google AI uh, machine where you talk to talk to it and kids use it for playing games or you can say Alexa, switch on the TV. You know, it's, it's, it's a simple gadget. And recently, I think yes, last week, 
Amazon was being sued because they were, they were using their data. Children were using Alexa for games or talking to it, but they said they would store this, they would delete their children's voices, but they did do that. And because AI depends on more data, we remember we said the machine learns from more information. The more you feed it, the better it learns. So Amazon retained um, some of the children's voices and the prompts they were making to Alexa. And last week they were sued by parents. So, and, that, and the conclusion is machine learning is no excuse to break the law. You have to work within um, the laws of data use, laws of data protection. So there can be challenges of using this big data. And that is how far we need to be very careful when we are using um, some of these big data sets. Because you need the data to develop the algorithms, but it has to be the right data to improve the algorithms that are being used by most of these tools. So anyway, as we talk about big data, there are aspects around the volume that we always um, maybe should know. These are called the Vs. They started off as three Vs and they became five Vs. Now there are so many Vs, but the volume is important. The velocity, the speed at which data is accumulated, like we've said, every second there is data being, uh, these are attributes of big data. Every second it's, it's compiling, it's, it's being added to the already existing big data. There's variety due to the different sources of data being generated, like we've all mentioned, from hospital records to Twitter, to smartwatch, to traffic, to air, air, air sensors, to everything. There's a lot of data. That's the variety of, of big data. Veracity refers to the quality and credibility. Is this data credible? Is it accurate? Sometimes you're using a lot of big data, but you need to take care. You need to you know, be cautious about the quality and the accuracy and the uh, who is in that data set, how is it collected? Those are aspects around the veracity of the data. Then the value, is it even useful in decision-making? That is another view that's becoming of interest because you might get data from one source, but again, because it's available, you need to take care. You need to make sure that it's also valuable and, and useful for whatever project you're using. The viscosity, uh, the complexity or the degree of correlation. As I think as people who have math background, we need to know that if certain variables are correlated, you need to account for that. You need to look out for them before you go ahead to make conclusions about from that data. Then the volatility, how long is the data valid? Uh, if you want to create algorithms that move with time, that's why sometimes you need to use recent data. Uh, you don't want to use data that was collected two centuries ago to make an algorithm that is going to help people now. So that volatility, is it, is it, is it volatile? Is the data useful as you develop, as you use it for any data science project? Then the viability, the, cap the, cap the capability to be live and active. Again, that's what we are seeing. Then the validity. And can you use, can you be able to tease out relationships from the data? And those are the kind of the Vs that, um, that the different attributes of big data that are talked about often. And then I uh, will talk very briefly about the variety. We've already seen that there are different types of, 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 um, of data. It can, be, <coughs> it can be structured data, sorry about that. Semi-structured and then unstructured data. And for structured data, it's kind of what we, we, we've been used to. It's in a good format, like think of it like um, an Excel. It's, um, it's uh, in database management systems, it's, it's structured. You have nice columns, you have data stored in a nice database, uh, CSV, those kind of, uh, sometimes those kind of data sets are really structured. And then it's uh it, it's 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 easy to work with. Then there is the unstructured. This is like Twitter. Twitter, if you tweet or audio or a Facebook post, those are completely unstructured data. A WhatsApp message, a web page, those are unstructured data sets because they do not fit in what we uh would be a very standardized kind of format. Then of course they are semi-structured. Sometimes they're text files that you can work with CSV files also falling here. 
and uh, sensor logs or, or other types of, of files. So these are kind of the varieties of data that we see structured, unstructured, and of course the, um, the semi-structured. I'm tempted to look at the chat. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Oops. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh God. I've lost. Let me first stop my slides. Sorry about that. But any comments in the chat? Any responses so far? No, ma. Go ahead. Go ahead, ma. Okay, I seem to have. Oh God, my computer is messed up. Just give me one second. To sort this. It's moving faster than me. <laughs> okay, I'm back here now. Okay, so we're there. And then uh, again, again, like you said, all the different sources, we need to learn how to process and make sense of them to integrate some of these different types of data from the multiple sources. We need to mine, store, analyze this data to get meaningful insights. And uh, this can actually grow a business, grow a research institution, grow your career. There are definitely profits. It can change the way healthcare is given. It can change the way agricultural products are being developed. It can change the way many things are happening because of the uh, massive variety of data. But uh, but then this kind of brings us to the how did you know data science? How data science comes in? So it's a tool to help us extract insights to solve real real wide problem, real world complex problems, and complex because you need we've learned that you need very many types of data from the different, these different varieties with different speed of data collection with different uh, usefulness validity to solve some of the problems that might not have been able to be solved prior to the advent of data science. So what's data science? It's the power to, to improve business. I, I just use business here, but it can be anything. Uh, if it's effectively utilized, it can be agriculture sector, it can be health, it might be education, but I'm just using business here as a generic term. Uh, it can be able to uh, and reveal hidden insights or patterns that are harnessed to make better decisions. It's uh, inefficient techniques and tools that are needed to uncover hidden insights. So you, you can use all these, these different tools to, to get patterns that might not have been easily seen with traditional, um, some of the methods that were used earlier. So it's a field that uses domain knowledge. You need to have somebody who is an expert in that knowledge. It combines statistical and computational techniques to extract insights from data. And like we see, it's a combination of many things. You need to know the knowledge. If you're talking about agriculture, sometimes as analysts, you tend to also want to deal with that domain. Sometimes it's good for you to get somebody who is uh, good at agriculture, good at health, good at health records, good at traffic data, somebody who is an expert in population or education, ask them about the critical knowledge as you build or as you do your data science, they should be able to help you to generate the right questions about that field of, of investigation that you are. They can also be able to help you understand the problem and see whether data is making sense as you roll out all these data science tools. You need mathematicians, because uh, math is important for data science to develop the algorithms, to do that predictive. And I think by the time you're done with these five weeks, you're going to be, many of you are going to be experts in uh, mathematical modeling and all the other uh, tools that are important. You need statistics and algebra. And then you also need skills of computer, of computer science because the ability to use technology, analyze the different complex algorithms, use different tools out there like R, SAS, Python, and do programming. So it's a combination of many fields and all these really build what we call a good data science field. 
ranging from statistical research, domain processing, computer, and of course, um, mathematics. So we'll see some use cases that data science has been uh, applied to. It's been used to detect anomalies. Anomalies are like errors or a bit of um, outliers in the data. You can use tools to see whether there are people who are clustered in different are not fitting any cluster, any kind of uh, clusters. We can see in, in banks, they use a lot of um, data science tools to detect fraud by seeing how somebody's spending. I don't know if you have like an ATM, you can find as soon as you put your ATM in a different country, sometimes you get a call from your bank immediately that says, you know, your card is being used at a very fast rate in a different country. So that those are all tools that are a, a, a combination of very many data science skills and tools and to help really uh, catch early fraud uh, patterns in um, for clients can be used to prevent cyber attack, basically deal with anomalies. For pattern recognition, again, we are seeing discovers, that data science can help you discover uh, different patterns in clients or in the data, if you go to uh, if you go to Amazon and you're buying something, you can buy uh, a phone, and then the next thing you see is uh, buy this phone cover as well. That is all a combination of different tools because they've discovered that people will buy the Samsung also want the screen saver for the Samsung. So it's pattern recognition. They lead to product or to you know offering different products. Uh, they can support supply chain. They lead to customer satisfaction and loyalty to different um, um, purchasing uh, activities. For supermarkets, again, the same thing. You can use it to understand purchases before droughts or different activities happening in the country. And then for predictive modeling, we've seen a lot of data science being used to, to predict customer behavior. Again, that is a bit of pattern recognition for marketing trends, uh, industry, a lot of activities that are really being, that are harnessing the predictive power of, of data science. And then for classification and categorizing, again, you can use some of this unstructured data using deep learning to recognize uh, voices, uh, look at different aspects that can be used with this unstructured data. And all these are tools that are becoming very readily available globally and in Africa. And it's not something that we should be left behind as the world progresses. And then there's a lot of sentiment and behavior analysis. If you can use uh, some of these tools, deep learning to dig through different sentiments. A lot of this was done during COVID. People would analyze the tweets that uh, were going on out there to understand the sentiments around certain things. And I'll show you a slide shortly. So you can use these tools to understand sentiments of people who are um, expressing themselves through social media platforms, through satisfaction surveys. Again, uh, travel and hospitality, they are using a lot of uh, data science to understand customer experience and uh, analyze different social media posts about a place. You can leave a review and somebody says, yo, I don't like that because of this review. Somebody is mining that data and you can actually get recommendations. And then, uh, of course, conversational systems. We are seeing chatbots. Uh, we are now seeing chat GPT, all this use of large language models that are out there to have conversations with um, human interventions or human to, to lead to human interventions through chats and conversations with machines. And then, of course, uh, we are seeing again robots, selfless driving, self, selfless, yeah, self driving cars and all that. So, there's a lot, a really a lot of information going on out there and use cases for data science. This is some work we did around mining Twitter. And again, it's just to show you that it's not, you know, we got the tweets from tweets that were around U Uganda, got tweets that were geolocated in Uganda, mined the tweets, and then found out what were the, what were the myths around COVID-19. At the time, COVID-19 had just come. Uh, what was the cause? People were thinking COVID is, you know, obtained by 5G or by antibiotics can prevent COVID. If you drink alcohol, if you eat garlic, there's some of the trends that were seen and they were really gotten from uh, harnessing data science and mining the tweets. And of course, you can use that to understand things around a community, what is coming out, what are people talking about from the radio, from the tweets, 
And that is uh, the power of really harnessing these types of data. So I'll talk about, so is there any question right now? I feel like I'm going very fast. Are we okay? It's fine. Yeah, okay. yeah it's we're fine. okay. Fine. Okay, good, good. Uh, this is a revision for many of you, I'm sure. So that's a life cycle. Again, we start from the business. And again, I'm saying business, but it's anything. Health problem, you understand the problem, the objectives, that's like the, the pipeline or the, 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 the cycle of a good data science project. You acquire the data, get it with the right sources, with the right characteristics from the right people, with the right permission, get the data integrated from different resources, store the data efficiently, either on premise or in the cloud, but as long as it's protected. And then the raw data need to be cleaned. They need to be missed. They need to be checked for missingness, consistency, unnecessary data, outliers. If you need to transform the data, that is step three. Then step four, you understand the patterns now. You're now trying to explore the data. You're doing a lot of data wrangling. What is in the data? What are the visualizations in there? Can you start to see useful insights? Can you generate a hypothesis? I, I am very worried about that, that, that last bullet there. In traditional, in traditional statistics, we start off with a hypothesis where I'm going to look at the effect of this drug on this outcome. And you set up with your hypothesis. But with the data that's coming out increasingly, sometimes you see more, you generate more hypothesis by looking at the data because remember it's coming from different sources. So you have the ability to generate even more hypotheses as you look at the data and explore it uh, uh, time and again. And then once you're done with that, you then fit the answers to the model that you, for the research question that you have, that you have, uh, that you have come up with. Of course, if you go deep down into how to do the actual, you have to split the data, build a model, and then go ahead to deploy this model, check for its uh, performance, look at the accuracy and all the other attributes of um, measuring performance of a model. And then from there, take the results to the domain expert again, do they make sense? How do we change them? How do we make them better? What have I controlled for? And it's a whole chain, but that is roughly what we all go through with data science, but also in our careers as data persons to make sure that we are going through this, this cycle. But however, as we are doing this, we need to be wary of certain things. As the data science um, field grows, we are seeing a lot of um, biases that we've, we've talked about, about the dangers. Uh, we can, we've seen computers decide which treatment one receives just based on uh, different algorithms that were built. We've seen a person, we've seen cases where uh, uh, you know, a person who wants to get a loan uh, is profiled as a, Poor creditor just because of the algorithm that they've developed. So we need to be very, very wary of bias in the data as we rely on um, as we rely on AI to automate many jobs and uh, do a lot of jobs that were really human based on human intelligence. We need to, at the back of our head, be sure that we need to look at these uh, algorithms very, very carefully. For example, if you're picking out a particular subject from, um, if you're using a, a subset of a population or a subset of a data set, how are you selecting this? Where did you that get the data to do that algorithm? Did you include everyone? Did you make, you know, what, what are the attributes about the other subjects that you've not included in your algorithm or in your model? So some of the aspects around bias are very, 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 very critical as we create uh, all these algorithms and uh, creating training data sets, testing data sets, we need to be very wary about the bias that might come in there and then know how the computer will interpret this data. Sometimes images are completely misunderstood by the robot. I've not given, oh, sorry, by the computer. You can put something and um, it gives you the complete opposite of what you think. Or because of the way that algorithms are trained, there are certain stereotypes that are um, that are embedded. Uh, an African woman looks like they will give you a woman carrying a you know a child on the back, and or if you say I want the picture of a doctor, 
most likely they won't put a woman because the way the data was um, being, the algorithm was being developed. In some cases, women are not, were not expected to be doctors or a doctor can be called a nurse because she's a woman. So there's a lot of biases. I won't go into down that discussion, but there's a lot of uh, biases, uh, sex-driven uh, biases in the way algorithms are being developed. There are racial-driven uh, algorithms that um, that divide racial um, discrimination. And so again, the point here is to try and make sure that you're using the right data with the right uh, ethics, and it's representative of the, the outcome that you want it to be. If you want a model that is going to be generalizable, then make sure that the data sets you pick are also representing the potential target. Uh, then how do you deal with this? Sorry, that was supposed to be an, uh, oh God, here I go again. How do you deal with, um, how do you deal, how do you deal with these outliers during analysis anyway, as I look for my slides again? Something gets messed up here. So I want to break here. How do you think we'll deal with some of these um, biases in any data science project? Any, any volunteers? I don't want to talk alone. I think. Yes, no, how? Okay. Sorry for yes. Okay, ma'am. According to uh, my understanding, I think so. If uh, we got the data where the outliers were there, so we will definitely cleaning the data. We will go through from the cleaning. Like uh, if someone is saying, uh, we have uh, 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 someone is uh, talking about their, uh, uh, you can say, uh, income. So definitely, uh, most of the time we didn't get the exact data, exact amount. So in that way, we will uh, just uh, uh, at that time, we uh, manipulate the data according to the, um, uh, you can say, uh, whatever they have uh, told us earlier on the base of this. So in my point of view. Okay, thank you, Nahal. Okay, um, can I go ahead? Yes, please. Yeah, I, I think um, um, it's an iterative process. As long mm. as uh, we, we 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 carried out uh, carry out this process in an iterative way, we get to learn more uh, and we get to train more. We should not be satisfied once we train a model and we, we we are done with it. We should constantly revisit the more data that is available. Uh, we get to retrain it uh, with the, uh, with the increased data, and that will help in dealing with some of the uh, bias. Okay, but if they are, and I know many of you have, you know, experiences around modeling and, and, and if you have outliers in a data set, for example, you have collected, and this is not only to data science, I mean, even our original modeling, traditional statistical modeling, if you have outliers in your data set, how, how do you often deal with them? Or are you guys using data that is always perfect? Has anybody had an experience where they had these huge outliers? Did they just delete them? Like, how do you deal with outliers in a data science or non-data science related modeling experience? Ma'am, can I speak? Yes, please. So if the outliers doesn't make any sense or it's not with respect to the context, we may delete the outliers. But if the outlays has a significance in our study or something, we take it and consider it. Okay, but what, what if there are many outliers and you drop all of them? Uh, no, ma'am. If there is uh, many outlays, that means that uh, outlay is important in the study. So you include. Okay, any other view? Thank you, Nahal. Um, I, I think I have, I have uh, an answer. I think one of the things that you could do if you have many to um, impute the missing data. So based on the other variables in your data frame on your data set, you could use imputation. Um, once you've identified uh, the, the missingness in the data. 
So you treat them as missing and then impute. That is if they're not related to the outcome. Sorry? You treat them as missing and then impute them. Yes. Okay. Of course, the imputation goes with a lot of assumptions. So you would have to find out what is the pattern of this missing. Yeah. Um, why are they missing? Are they related to the outcome? And that's like a whole, um, a whole, a whole topic of how to deal with that. But also sometimes going back to the the data, you know, the whole chain. Remember, we say the whole cycle. You might find there's just some uh, entry that was going poorly, or and you can actually clean. Sometimes, as analysts, we want to stop. We just want to remain at our computers and move on. If it's missing, impute gone. But I think looking at the whole cycle, going back to the domain experts and say, look, I have this weird, is the measurement different? Well, these maybe if they are lab values, they might be with a different um, diagnostic tool that used them with different units. So I guess it's important to understand why the outliers are there and then create the right uh, system to, to check them. Check in with the um, check in with the um, with the <coughs> the people who have collected the data, and then uh, and then yeah, find that I'm seeing some charts here. Let me see. We can have outliers from the data. Okay, check whether these outliers are not from wrong imputation. If it's part of the information, then it should be part of the computation. To do with outliers, one can resurvey the data points if you have the funds to. Uh, if it's thousands of records, uh, delete the outlier data point. If resurvey is not um, feasible, delete. Yes, delete is a very good. Uh, very. I, I. I just always worry about deleting records, uh, but always try and investigate. Some might just need to be transformed to the others, depending on um, how the data were collected. You need to work with researchers. Yes, what are the meaningful values? And if they're outliers, and extract them and send them to check. I think yes, that is what we really need to, uh, to, 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 to do what, to deal with outliers. Maybe the data needs to be transformed in a particular manner, look at it compared to other data sets that are similar. So I think these are some of the challenges we go through on a day-to-day, -day, not necessarily data science, but as a day-to-day -day person who is working with data, we are always forced to look, check, and check, and check before you uh, proceed and come up with a, a final model that might not be representative of the, the data set or the target population that you want to, to make, uh, to infer with your results. Okay, so in terms of skill sets and tools that are critical, like we've said, in terms of statistics, you need to know some, uh, this is really core to data science. You need to know some of these statistics, not some, many statistical tests, probability, distribution of theory, database language and querying, and statistical software. It's, it's, it's good to have that knowledge. It will help you with uh, manipulating some of this data. You need to have some programming, and there's a lot of tutorials on how to start R, Python, and other, other tools that uh, can be used out there. You need to know how to extract and process data. <coughs> and this can come from, sorry about that, this can come from multiple sources. And of course, uh, most, most of the, the, you know, what is really most important is exploring this data. Again, these outliers, that's a lot of skill in dealing with missingness, looking at the, the null values, where are they now, how to clean them, how to explore the patterns, look for outliers. That's like the biggest part of, uh, of creating this whole nice pipeline of a data science project. So we need to have these skill sets. And I'm pretty sure by the time you're done with these five weeks, many of these you may have already, uh, or at least revised them, or at least gotten an introduction to some of these skills. We need to know some of the deep learning tools, supervised and supervised learning. We'll talk about that shortly. You need to know how to process um, structured and unstructured data. And there are a lot of tools out there. I'll share the slides. You need to do some visualizing. Can you 
visualize the data with software that are out there right now, like Tableau, Power BI, Digiplot, all these are uh, using R Shiny. These are things that are out there that um, anybody who wants to dive deeper into data science should at least have um, nowhere to go for that. And of course, be creative. The whole process of uh, data science, you need to know how create if you're stuck here, work with this, try this. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a lot of an iterative process, like someone has said here. It's not a quick fix. Be creative, develop work plans, check in with the domain experts, and then synthesize your results with the, um, the target audience and the discovery that you make from the data so that there's context before you share it. Uh, I'll now go very briefly through some of the types of machine learning. Let me say this supervised and the machine is trained on labeled data. From labeled, you know, you really know what the output, what the outcome is in this data. You know what the data is labeled because you, you, you know exactly what you are searching for. The, um, for example, fraud detection, spam filtering, medical diagnosis, that the data has most of the variables in there um, labeled. And then for supervised learning, we can do the classification. The output is the, the variable of interest there is categorical. And of course, we've already, many of you might have already seen some of the models that use classification, like the random forest decision tree. So that the variables are already are categorical. They might be binary or not binary, but you know that they are categorical outcomes. And I don't think I need to remind us here what's categorical. And then for regression methods, supervised, you're looking at continuous variables. And here models like regression, um, multivariate regression, the lasso where you're dropping out variables based on their contribution, all these um, types of models and that are supervised. And they are, they are all part of the grand scheme of the different tools that we can use there. And then the unsupervised, they are unlabeled data. You don't know sometimes what is what, and that's a simple picture. You need to first sort the data, understand put it in uh, different groups or clusters, then you can go ahead and, 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 and do the models. Prediction is without supervision. The machine itself identifies patterns from the data set that you give it. And the types here are the k-means. Uh, those are really the algorithms that we use. And then uh, there are other types that uh, help you find different algorithms, sorry, different relationships or patterns within the data. And then semi-supervised, again, it's between supervised and unsupervised. You use a combination of labeled. Many times, most of the work we use, the models are a bit of, the data sets we get might be labeled or unlabeled, but uh, they are mainly, you know, uh, supervised, semi-supervised data sets because sometimes you don't know exactly what the, the main outcome of, of prediction is. And then the, the last there is the reinforcement types of machine learning where you're doing uh, automatically, the AI automatically explores its surrounding. And uh, it's, it's more of, a, it's, it's, a, it's learning from the experiences and the performance from the model. And then um, it, it maximizes the way it performs. And this is kind of a more advanced uh, type of, 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 of uh, machine data science tools. So, and again, it's mainly used in gaming applications and we're seeing a lot of advancement for these models out there. So I think this we've already gone through in terms of what steps do we do in uh, applying machine learning. I think I'll skip that. And then I'm going to the jobs. What are the jobs out there for data scientists? I think there are, there are different jobs that rely on data science. You can be, a data science 101, you understand the challenges of any business, you offer the best solution using data, you can be an expert in our Python and other complementary technologies. Then there are those who are really analysts. Um, and this, you do the visualization, that can be your strength in this whole schema of data science. You can create platforms, dashboards, uh, modify algorithms, problem solving qualities. And again, you can do this with very many software out there. Then the other data architects, these are creating the blueprint. If you look at the pyramid of data science, the, at the bottom, the greatest part is how do you extract this data? How do you load it? How do you transfer it? Where is it stored? 
Uh, where do you do the data warehousing? Is it on the cloud? Is it, um, what are the different tools out there to extract their tools out there? Like, you know, standardizing this data, we'll look at some of this today. So this is where the architecture of the data sits. Where is the data? How can it be shared? In what format? What are the tools? And then the data engineer really builds that whole ecosystem, uh, looks at the different existing systems that are out there in looking, handling this data, the newer versions, the databases, uh, the technologies. And again, it's really supporting the data architecture and then the data analysts and scientists and the data scientists up there. So the two bottom are really of, um, very technical and uh, look at looking at systems of data extraction and also systems for hosting the data and the software that are out there to mine this data. And then of course we have the statisticians, those ones we all know who statisticians are, business analysts. These are again becoming very critical to any business out there in finance, in you know, for business intelligence, in banks, they're doing a lot of um, uh, predictions and, and profiling of what uh, entails the best products out of, um, the, make the best out of the different products that are being churned out by, by uh, different businesses. And of course, in the database administrators, these ones I think we already know, allocating different functions to different teams. And the data manager, this one is really looking at the day-to-day -day assigning roles to the skill sets, good management of the data. They have to have good problem solving skills, understanding IT tools, and other sets that we see commonly as we, we work with data. So as I conclude, data science really is going to help us discover knowledge through various steps. We have to extract, prepare, build, test, create reports, visualize. And then the last step, sometimes as data people, we only stop there. But I think the onus is once you get your results, make sure you check in with the domain experts. If you can even contribute to the last mile, there's a lot of talk about last mile data science, where if you come up with this algorithm, how do you make sure it's now turned into a usable product? It's turned into a web uh, application. It's turned into a chatbot that can be used to help anybody that you have intended um, to support with the data. So there's a lot of, um, in Africa, we tend to step stop at that stage, but I think there's increasingly more uh, advocacy to see last mile data science products in Africa. There are lots of innovations coming out so that as we use the data, we're also coming up with tangible solutions that can um, improve livelihood and uh, um, improve our population health and transform lives with the data that we collect. Data science will always remain key in uh, unhealthing and I think different hidden patterns in the data. And again, we've said you need to have a good knowledge in statistics, computer science, and ability to be agile and work with different complex, work on different and complex problems. Consult, ask, read, always update yourself with different tools. And then uh, of course the other skill sets that cannot be undervalued. You need to have, you know how you need to know how to communicate your results. Uh, we've seen uh, sometimes when data people come up with results and there's always this gap between what the models say and what the policy makers does from the results that you give them. And there's a huge gap right now because the data communication from the modeling team to the policy makers doesn't happen in a manner that is absorbable. The results tend to stay uh, very technical. So there's a lot of advocacy now for data documentation, sorry, data communication. Can you communicate your results in a manner that the policymaker can come up with a very quick fix when he's making his budget, she's making the budget. And this comes from the results that, uh, that, that, are, that are generated by the model as if there's a Ministry of Health planning for the next pandemic and you've developed this dynamic model with these kinds of assumptions you need to break those results down in a manner that the policymaker who is making the national budget can appreciate them and say, all right, if I invest this amount of money, I'm going to save this number of lives. So the onus here is for data people to be able to communicate your results in a manner that really uh, helps the policymaker make the right decisions after. 
and to become a huge, uh, it takes a, it to become, the, to become a good data science, you need time. It needs time. You need to invest in yourself. There are a lot of uh, material online for Sarah, different, different tools out there. We cannot exhaust them in these four weeks, but this was meant to, for those of you who have not taken this step, for those of you who feel like you need to join or be good data scientists, you need to invest time, get onto short courses, uh, get onto some of these books online and teach yourself and be able, and join data community, community of data scientists. There are lots of communities out there in R, in Python, there are a lot of materials posted on GitHub. There's a lot of content out there right now in this era of technology, if you want to learn something, uh, it's not, it's the right time to get the right technology. So uh, invest in yourself to become a good data scientist. That way you can have a huge impact on your organization. There's a growing demand for data-driven careers. So anybody who is data-driven, this is the time for you to grow your career. I think we also saw that during COVID, everybody was interpreting data, the efficacy of vaccines, the effectiveness, the, the, the numbers needed, the number of vaccines, the number of testing. Everybody was really now talking data. So it's the right time for anybody who wants to grow their career in data. Most of you are already data-driven, but don't stop at it. Just continue to grow your career. And then obviously, as you invest, hopefully they should be better pay and uh, build your career and be able to support different um, teams and have a diverse growth in your career. I think uh, that is my last slide. I acknowledge uh, uh, Sam, Samuel E.D. from FHRC who shared some of the slides. So that is it. I want to stop here for any questions. I know it's top of the hour. We might need to be breaking, but I would welcome any questions right now or feedback, experiences of what you've gone through as data people and uh, how you think this is a field that can be uh, of importance. And if there are any questions, please open the mic and, and uh, ask over to, to, to me. Anybody out there with a comment? Machine learning engineer. Yes. Um, yes, I think machine learning engineer is kind of feeding into the data engineer. I would not say they are very different. That is so dear. You've asked what about machine learning engineer. Yes. There are now also other fields like cloud engineers, people who are mining, sorry, who are managing this. The cloud platform, as you know, there's a lot of investment now going on out there in terms of where do you store your data? Do you store it on a computer in a server that is static in the, at a particular institution, or are you going via the cloud? And there's a lot of um, a lot of advancement in cloud engineering. How do you create different firewalls? How do you create platforms where people can access data, can share their data? can you know, work remotely with virtual machines. There's also that field that is really supporting um, a lot of data science out there. So there's, there's, there's a lot happening and I can't say I've exhausted all the careers, but it's just uh, an introduction of where you want to go, which of the different facets of data science you might want to, to take on and uh, feel free to go on and invest in yourself and you know, get more skill sets that will benefit you. Okay, any other any other question? So was it just a revision? It's very quiet here. Uh, how many of you are already data scientists anyway? Are ready? Well, we are, because we all work with data, but how many can self-identify that, you know, I'm, I'm already practicing data scientists with the different fields that we've seen that contribute to data science. Yeah, for, for me, I'm actually pursuing a master's in deep data analytics. So okay. it's not totally new, it's something that I'm actually picking up. Of course, I've picked up some aspects that I can identify with and mm. uh, some areas that I, I think I need to broaden from your presentation otherwise thank you so much thank you and do you enjoy the are you enjoying the the, the, the masters the analytics the masters in analytics definitely definitely i think 
uh, that's one motivation why I had to, uh, to, to join this course because I, I can see a lot of the other areas of application and you know it's quite interesting. For me, I have already been in, in the data field being a uh, database administrator and that, that, that really makes, uh, it, it adds a lot to, to what I'm already doing. Mm. Okay, that's good. Good feedback. Yeah, and the field is always changing. Uh, that's the thing about data science. It's, uh, it's just changing so much every single day. Uh, okay, any specific thoughts? Uh, let me see. There's a question from Zachary Salah. Any specific thoughts on data science in the context of LMICs? That's a good question. So there's been a lot of investment. Okay, there is increasing demand and call for investment in data science. I don't know if you've heard about the Data Science Africa Initiative. This was launched around three years ago. I think it's a five-year project. It should be coming to the third year. And it's specifically targeting building capacity in data science. And I think for those of you in South Africa, I think that's where most of the, uh, the project is based. It's an NIH-funded project uh, that is focusing on building capacity of data science in uh, many of the LMICs because we've realized that the, the era where you collect data in Africa, take it out of Africa for analysis no longer sells. You have to have the capacity in the context and that is the very reason for this grant. Build capacity, make sure that the data producers work with the analysts on ground, understand the data, ask the right questions. But to do this, there's, there's need for a lot of capacity building in the different facets of data science. Let it be statistics, so data engineering or uh, visualization or any, any of the, you know, the whole aspects of data science. So there's increasing demand and rationale to increase capacity. Some universities have embarked on um, in, uh, embedding data science. In, in the beginning, in the, in the earlier ages, it was very hard to get courses that are data science driven in many of the universities, but it's now changing. Many grants, many courses have now opened up data science. They are masters in data science, PhDs in all kinds of uh, analytic, analytic skills. So there's, it, it's now is the time to invest in data analysis capacity on site. It might not, it might be mathematical modeling, it might be AI, it might be software engineering. I think that there are grants that are now taking on um, most of these activities. Zachary, I see your hand up. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Yeah, just, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, first, uh, thanks for the response. I think it's uh, very helpful, but uh, just a follow up question. So, in traditional research, for instance, when I want to collect data, so I will ensure, for instance, that my uh, uh, sample will be a representative of the population of interest. But in the context of, uh, let's say, big data or data science, so how do the research, how does the researcher take into account uh, uh, this issue, for instance, here? Because let's say, for instance, uh, I'm interested in using, for instance, uh, tweets. So I can easily understand that uh, there will be huge difference between uh, urban and rural area. So if I'm interested in uh, an outcome, health outcome, mm -hmm. so how can I take into account the differences between uh, urban and rural area, for instance? Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Zachary. Uh, you raise, uh, you get back to the original question that we talked about about bias in some of these, uh, I'll just talk about how to do it, but just to step back a bit. When we're doing that analysis of the tweets, one of the first comments we got, uh, uh, how representative is this population? If you look at the population of Uganda, at the time, the population using tweets, uh, using Twitter was very, very small. One of the things that, when you're doing, it's first of all, I think have 
that unbiased uh, heart on when you're going to start a data science project because you need to know what are the potential biases in your data set. I think for me that remains the fundamental so that even the results that you generate can only be extrapolated to the sample that you selected. If you have a data set where 80% are rural and 20% are urban, and then you're making an algorithm that you expect it to, you know, to benefit the 20%. When you're doing the actual data science, like we said, you can arrange your data, split it up, and make sure that that representation of the urban and rural fits in the different training data sets. However, the bigger question is where do you get the data? How do you understand, how do you interpret the results of, uh, of the results or from the data science, from the models that you, that you put in there? Do you need to weight different populations differently? I guess this is even beyond just data science. And like you said, in traditional statistics, you still go and you know, pick your sample size, it's representative. Even there, sometimes there are biases. So it's just a bigger framework of, if you're doing this study, where you're getting the right population, at analysis, how do you control for it? How do you split the data in a manner that you know, represents both uh, the biases, both the populations in the training and the testing data set? But also there's a lot of advocacy now in ethics committees. There's, there are grants that are now training people sitting on ethics committees and telling them, look, if this, if this data science you know, proposal comes in, these are the questions to ask before you even approve the study. Where are the data being collected? How are they going to anonymize the data? If they are developing this algorithm, are they going to post it? Can we review it? What are the types of potential biases? How can you correct it from the time you pick the data? That is if you're going through a formal ethics uh, you know, process of using this data. So there are different steps and it's not a quick fix, but it's a whole you know, system. As you're embarking on this project, you need to have your heart on to know that, okay, I've selected this population. If I'm making that conclusion, I have to say, interpret these results with, this question because only 20% of my population were from urban. I accounted for it this way, but it's something that you need to know that they might best be generalizable to this population. And I think that is what is the right ethics to do. Uh, post your code out there. How did you, you know, how did you account for the bias, put your algorithm? There are now platforms like GitHub, throw your code there and make sure that anybody can critique it positively and can um, and help you as you, you actually uh, do some of these analysis. And I think um, there is need to digital, no, no, I another question here. I, I don't know if I answer your question, uh, Zachary. Okay, yes, so it's a step-by-step, -step, but my question, my, my question for anybody who works with the data, always, always think of what could I have left out? Why are the results showing this? Why do I need to stratify? Do I need to use a different method that takes care of the different clusters in the population and some of these tools you learn with time, but um, it's a very good thing that uh, you need to think of the internal and external validity of your results. And I see uh, Yusuf confirming that. Uh, let me see. Digitalize, the question about digitalizing. Digitalizing. So yes, I think there's a lot of investment also going on now in digital data collection in Africa because of the in the, the because of the um, the advent of uh, mobile technology. It's important that <coughs> we harness some of this. We can harness some of these uh, available tools to be able to collect data in a digital format. One of the reasons why many data sets remain unused in Africa is the fact that they're still lying in records, in registers, stuck in a room and unused. When you have to report to the funder, you only count, aggregate, and tell the funder, and that is it. But the value of the other records remains um, unused. So there's, I mean, for anybody here, if you're a young researcher, you know, it's time to really think about 
how to digitalize some of the data collection. It might be voice, it might be, it might be, you know, uh, voice, or it might be a mobile phone app, or it might be any kind. There are lots of digital tools right there. So it's 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 more of trying to help the data move from hard copy to uh, to to uh, to digital records that can be harnessed. There's technology right now that is doing a lot of um, a lot of uh, digitalizing using optical character recognition. You take a picture of the of the tool, look at it, um, look at it, and then see how that image can be transformed to a digital record, and that way you can have a, um, a uh, you can have a very quick data point immediately as compared to hiring a data person, getting the data entered, and uh, that process takes longer. So there are tools right now, and I think it's the generation now to develop our own interventions, our innovations that can read the language, interpret the over 2000 languages that, out, that are out there in Africa, uh, look at the uh, different sources of data and be able to, to, uh, to, to, to make digital records out of this. There are people who are mining radio data, uh, so I asked somebody here from Makere Kelly. So there's a there's a team that's already mining data from radio, and all these are data sources that are you know coming from unconventional to digital records, and being able to use this data in real time as compared to the native way of paper based. You know, take a long time, enter the data, clean it. So I think the era is changing with time, and we just need to move with it and be able to. Uh, be able to to uh, to harness this and and collect more data in a digital format. I don't know what your experiences are in the different uh, in the different and I know many people are not mentioning where they're coming from, but I'm pretty sure in many parts of Africa we are seeing seeing a lot of um, uh, data being collected on hard hard paper uh, on hard records on paper based uh, records. Is that different in your different countries or are you guys all digital? I, 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 so I, I, in, I, I, okay, so in Ghana like this, uh, with our health system, the district regional and then the teaching hospitals, most of the data collect or the data collection now is, is electronic, has been digitalized. So the paper-based data collection, you know, is 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 fading away. We normally see the paper based when you know you go to the rural facilities, the cheap compounds we have in Ghana. That is where, let me see, their data collection is normally paper based. But I know with time there are policies in place to gradually migrate them onto the electronic databases. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think that's what we're also seeing in many parts of key, you, you know. East Africa, uh, but I am I'm seeing a, a message from no uh, no no bull here. You say many of the data in South Africa are digital. Like, what's your experience in uh, now linking these these digital records? Are they what's the quality of this data? Because at least you're one step ahead from having paper to um, digital records. What's your experience in analyzing this data? in South Africa. Oh, hi. So it's much cleaner than the one that's paper-based because the researchers, they use red cap and then they're able to fix and impute the data themselves instead of just copying from the paper and then transferring. So it's much better than the one they used before by paper. So for most of our studies, they use red cap. So yeah, much mm. better. Okay, so it's like provider entry, immediate data collection, yeah, uh, great, and the data available. Yes, yes. So there's less errors there. Okay, but they still they still need they, they still need for massive steps in cleaning this data anyway as well. Yes, yeah, they still yeah we still clean it after because. Yeah, because it's humans that are imputing, like if someone is putting a PID, like a person, but what you call 
the participants ID number, they can still make mistakes and then we're able to identify those and they can still fix it. But it's much better than the paper one because sometimes you can't even read the handwriting. So mm -hmm. if it's online on the digital thing, it's easier. Okay, great. That's fine. Uh, I'm looking at Yusuf. Yes, I'm looking the note on the Twitter. And then uh, Dr. Kathika, a universal access of medical data will be helpful. However, there are, here the data has been collected under individual hospitals, but not accessible from one hospital. That's has been emerged. Digital access, the government applications. So you, uh, Dr. Kathika, you raise uh, an important uh, point about data access and um, sharing one of the greatest challenge that limit greatest challenge to data science for any data driven project is access to the data right from the different ministries to the different hospitals to banks like it's sharing uh data is 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 remains a challenge but at the same time not that you need to you know, sharing can happen, but there's a lot of need for cautious sharing. A data sharing data in a manner that protects the subjects in the data sets. But I know that they are now, uh, we'll talk about some of this later on. There's a lot of advancement around federated platforms where you remain with the custody of the data, particularly hospital records. The data remains on site, but you now create these ETLs, extract, transform, transform and load, odds that where you can share just what you need to share. Sometimes you should only share synthetic data and then be able to get quick insights from, for example, hospital records. But it remains, it remains a challenge in many parts of, 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 of many parts, many parts, many countries here because the data is in siloed. It still remains siloed. It's in different disparate sources. You find somebody with a hospital records are there that they are their data are not findable. You can't uh, you can't access them. The systems are not interoperable with anything else, and that way that the data remains and okay, it can be shared. And we'll have a very a very short introduction to making data fair after our break and harmonizing this data. But there is need now to at least in trusted environment, share data for bigger collaborative uh, analysis that will make inputs that, that will get outputs that will inform the, at least improve healthcare or improve the way different diagnostics can be developed, increase, uh, help support in predictive analysis or precision medicine, which is still a long way in certain parts but of Africa. But I think, that the time now is to think about open science at least and and make your data usable, shareable, and findable to certain populations or certain spaces where big data sets are needed. Because at the end of the day, if you the data are hoarded in one center, it still doesn't make much sense. But it has to be done under the right principles, uh, with the right ethics before you share the data protect the individuals and make sure that the results are aggregated in a manner that none of the participants can be um, identified from the records. But the whole topic of data sharing. So at FHRC, we are uh, taking really um, strides to enforce or at least increase the awareness of harmonizing data. And we'll have a session on that. So when you standardize your data, make sure that you can you know, share it, at least certain aspects of it with increasing technology and contribute to bigger collaborative uh, analysis that are much needed right now to drive solutions in Africa. So we'll talk about that very briefly, but yes, data sharing is, is a big, big, big topic. Okay, uh, various centers have been emerged digitally access the government, access the government applications. I didn't know what that was. The digital data system is very good within the healthcare system in Ghana and it works hand in hand. Okay, so that is good. If uh, in Ghana you have most of the data digital, that is good. So you have access to 
um, access to digital data. But my question is about record linkage. So with these digital platforms, can you easily link participants? So if a participant goes to one hospital on Monday and the next week they have traveled and they go to another hospital, how is the linkage uh, in the healthcare systems? Maybe something to learn from the team from Ghana. How is record linkage happening and what are the advantages? What are the, what, what's not working with these digital platforms? Anybody here, I've seen James uh, who has commented about the digital platforms. James, do you have any feedback on the success of the digital data systems in Ghana and how they've been integrated with the paper base? Um, yeah. How is the record linkage with this paper with the digital platforms? So, uh, the integration of the, the digital the digital system, such as the links and the digital system, it's still effective. Okay. Health care professionals, mm. health care professionals, some of them have We can hardly hear it. Maybe it's me. Okay. Okay. At least you got your feedback in the system. So it's it's good to know that uh, at least there is the availability of linking the digital with the paper based is functional in Ghana and the data are shared. I see a comment from Dr. Kathika, personalized sharing of data may be possible at this moment, but not hospital level. A reference doctor may share the data to the specialist. I think within a hospital setting, there's some local data sharing. You can enter hospital, and the lab does some tests, they are immediately shared with the, you know, the next uh, point of care in the healthcare system. But for us, and I think that's okay for patient management and for, um, you know, perfect healthcare when somebody's within the health setting of that health, of that health facility. But I think what is increasingly becoming, what is increasingly becoming needed is the, um, sharing widely and of course this has different aspects to it like it's you can do it but in uh because many parts of of europe and us have you know centralized some of the hospital records they are standardized they're using certain uh, vocabularies and the data shared protected of course and you can use this data for quick decisions but it's, it's going to take us some time for a lot of advocacy and and trust issues and data protection frameworks. For example, in Africa with 40, 54 countries, I think the different data protection acts, they are over, there are so many data protection frameworks in Africa. And of the 44 countries, I think 10 also have enacted full-blown data protection frameworks. And this just goes to show the diversity of data protection and data governance in Africa. And if we are to if we are to move towards more inter intercountry regional uh, sharing of data, we need to recognize the differences in the different countries of data governance, and it's something that um, may hinder a lot of the collaborative. Uh, projects, but I think that we we are much better than uh, say ten years ago, and the advocacy, the need, data science is just showing that you need to use your data and use all this data to make a data driven decisions. So it's much better than it was, but there's still a lot of work to do. So Adam says in Ghana, the data sharing is limited within facilities. We are yet to get a centralized data sharing system where you have patients' records being shared across facilities. Yes, uh, I don't know how many of you have seen some of the common data models out there that are really 
built for sharing hospital records. And it will take a while, but it's it's certainly getting better. But I know sharing data out of facilities remains a challenge, uh, despite the different that the different uh, the different frameworks. And there are a lot of initiatives going on right now in Africa. For example, there is the African Population Court Consortium that is creating a blueprint for standards for access to data from longitudinal healthcare, from longitudinal cohorts. And the blueprint is just going to show, all right, this is what you need to do with this kind of data, make sure this protection um, is embedded before you share the data. And hopefully this blueprint will help us change the narratives around data sharing in this context and maybe we have bigger data sets across country, within country, across different institutions and across countries, across regions and the continent at wide. So we still have a lot of work to do, but I am positive that um, with the advances of data science and big data, we're on the right track to the right track to getting more data accessible from different sources. Okay, it's time for a break. I think, and uh, we need to, how long is the break, Kevin? We're just passing time towards the break. Kelvin, how long is the break? Uh, 30 minutes. 30 minutes, okay, yes. that's fine. Uh, and the next session is how long? One hour again or yeah. two? One hour. All right. All right, we'll meet again at the top of the hour. Uh, thank you for listening. And for that, I'll just take you very briefly into some of the aspects of uh, how AI has been applied to public health. And then after that, we'll have one more break and do the last session and that will be it for me. So see you at the top of the hour and thank you for the uh, activity in the list. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. See, we are 30. Thank we you, can, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I think we could we can we can resume because we need to use one hour. I want to just take up one hour of the two remaining sessions and then I'll let you I'll leave the, the day up for the other sessions. So I think we are 30, but people join us along the way. Let me share my slides. Okay, so for this session, uh, I'll again in the spirit of just um, promoting more of the use of data science or AI in the African context. So for the next 30 minutes, I'll take you through what are, what are some of the, okay, one hour and 30 minutes available. All right, so I can see we have one hour. We'll use that and we'll be that we'll be we'll be we'll have completed both uh, both presentations by then. So uh so for the next 30 minutes, I'll take you through some of the applications where AI has uh revolutionized public health in Africa. And just to trick your minds around some of the innovations in your capacity, what do you think are the imminent problems? How can you see uh, AI? supporting public health in the different countries that are represented here. And uh, I'll start off with, with this. And I, I come from an organization where <laughs> our director is really a uh, pro-African. And one of the things that we talk about daily at APHRC is that sometimes Africa is looked at as a country. And I think there's a book by a famous writer that says Africa is not a country. And as we develop the AI capacity in the different, for the different use cases in Africa, we need to recognize that it's not one block. There's a lot of um, diversity in Africa. Different countries are at different stages of their health systems, of their analytical capacities. 
And even when we look at different health indicators, there's a lot of diversity. And as we develop uh, and transform public health using AI, we need to understand this. But in the next 30 minutes, we should at least see the state of public health in Africa. Uh, why artificial intelligence for public health in Africa? Why should we, is it, should we use it? And then how has it been leveraged? And uh, what are the challenges and opportunities for enhancing, for enhancing uh, public health in Africa? And uh, concerns, what are the concerns really as we look at the use of AI and then some call to action as we promote these tools. As, as you can see, there's a lot of diversity in, in the African uh, continent. And so I'm restricting this to Africa, but uh, and because this, I thought this talk will be helpful as you move ahead with um, developing skill sets around analysis for data and promoting data science in this context. So again, just to say that when you look at the state of public health in Africa, it, in whatever indicator that is put out there, there is not much equity, there is not much uniformity. Many of the indicators, there's a lot of diversity. The countries are not the same. The investments need to be tailored to the different uh, countries. We need to think of Africa not as one block, but as the different countries that contribute. And even as we roll out these different tools, we understand the, the diversity in the different uh, 55 states that are out there. So I'll just share a couple of maps to show you, even without telling you the indicator, that the African context is different. If you look at all the other continents, when you come to Africa, that's where you always see the different shades in almost all indicators. And we'll look at what indicators these are. Again, whether good or bad, you'll find diversity and it's always greatest in Africa. And this is another map. Again, you can see all the other countries might be uh, less or more, uh, more or similar, but in Africa, you'll have uh, literally the shades of all the scales because of the diversity in different, um, the diversity of the different stages of public health in the 55 member states. Again, this is another map where see a lot of diversity, a lot of uh, differences in Africa. Same case here, um, whatever the indicator is, there's a lot of uh, differences in all the countries. And again, the story doesn't end here with all the other indicators. You see that there's always um, every, there's a lot of different countries at different stages of many of the indicators of public health. So public health systems in Africa, are they actually achieving equity? Can you be at that stage where if you roll out this tool, it can help the whole of Africa? And I think the answer remains no, because, because of the diversity, the differences in the different countries, whatever we develop, whatever tools, whatever algorithms, whatever innovations, we need to be cognizant of the fact that different parts, different countries are at different stages and the investment in public health needs to take care of that. So again, just to show you now what the titles were for those maps, the first was life expectancy. And you can see in some parts of Africa, it's 60, others it's as good as 54, others in, uh, you know, in Northern Africa, it goes up to close to 80 years. If you look at child, child mortality, same maps, some parts of Africa have very dark shades, almost 50% child mortality rates, and others have capped child mortality and it's less than 1%. This is a share of death from indoor air pollution. Again, that's the same map I showed, a lot of diversity. Different cities have almost 25% of deaths are due to air pollution in different parts of Africa. So you can see the diversity and the need to have, to use AI, but, or to use data or to come up with solutions that are country specific. This is a share of death that attributed to smoking. And you can see that it also varies with different countries. Uh, the share of death from HIV AIDS as of 2019. And all these are all these maps are from our world in data that was um, downloaded as of the global burden of disease in 2019. And again, you see a lot of uh, disparity in certain parts, different countries or different deaths, for example, 100%, 70%, 80%. 
close to most of the deaths in Southern Africa are caused uh, due to HIV AIDS. And then in Southern parts of Yadak Africa, there is a very lower proportion of that. This is uh, the death rate from diarrhea diseases. Again, a lot of diversity. Some countries are really, really dark, like 500 per 100,000 in uh, some of the African countries. So this is COVID-19 vaccine doses administered per 100 people. Uh, this is this year in April 2023. And again, some countries have gone ahead to intensify their um, vaccination, whereas others still remain less than 50% per 100 are vaccinated. So I think the message there is Africa is different. As we roll out AI, as we use data science, as we build capacity, as we come up with innovations, always think through what is best for the country, what is best with available data, what is the underlying health problem, and how can you contribute to that as people who are using data to drive policy in the different countries. So if we go to the next point, which is what is the rationale for AI in public health? Again, we'll not repeat this, but artificial intelligence is you know, demonstrated it's intelligence that's demonstrated by machines, computers that mimic the cognitive intelligence of humans and animals. And it, that's why it's actually official in its, in its wording. It holds a great potential to improve public health in Africa. Mm -hmm. We think that the increased AI, increased analysts, increased um, data analysts will contribute to this potential because uh, AI applications in healthcare can save almost 150 billion by 2026 in, in, uh, in Africa. If we roll out AI, that was a study by Oyemi published in the Frontiers in Digital Health. If we roll out more of these AI applications, we have the potential to, to save billions by the next two years. So it is, it's timely. AI applications have the utility in all dimensions of public health. Public health has three main dimensions. There's disease prevention, there's health promotion, and and curative devices. So it has the capacity to contribute to all these aspects of public health. And how has it been used literally in Africa? Again, different countries have taken on different uh, innovations and these are driven by some of the challenges that are most pressing in the, diff in the respective countries. And I'll share a couple here. For example, we see that Kaposi sarcoma, which is a common type of cancer, curable, and are very common among persons living with HIV, but if detected early, and it's actually, it's, it's a skin cancer that can be solved, but the diagnosis of Kaposi sarcoma remains a challenge in many parts of Africa. And we've seen this being used, <coughs> uh, being improved. Uh, we have seen AI being uh, utilized for screening and diagnosis of very common uh, diseases, like Kaposi sarcoma. So this is an AI powered skin detection device for screening uh, Kaposi sarcoma on the skin. We've seen different mobile applications that have that have been used to, uh, to, to screen for TB. Some are voice, sometimes um, uh, are voice recognitions, or we've seen tools where a person coughs into the, the tool and the, the, the recording is, um, is, is recorded and then are used to find out whether that cough is related to TB. We've had, uh, we've seen tools that have captured the, the X-ray and then use AI to read that X-ray in settings where radiographers are, or radiologists are very, or people who can interpret this X-ray are very limited in different parts of the, of the country. So there's a lot of innovation around using these digital platforms for screening TB. There's also um, a point of care digital site cytology with artificial intelligence for cervical cancer screening. Again, when you get the slide or the swab, it's mounted on a tool and quickly in a minute, you can read and tell uh, whether a woman is likely to get cervical cancer or not. And all these are advances that are being put out there to kind of bridge the gap in the different countries based on what is available, based on the resources that are needed, but in attempt to really for inform public health and um, reduce disease burden in Africa. And then we've also seen AI in being used to increase access to healthcare. When you look at a report, I think it was by WHO, the, the numbers of doctors to patients 
uh, the doctor to patient ratio in Africa is about one to 10,000 in some countries. It might be better in different countries, like I said, with the diversity, but that's averagely. It's about one doctor sees 10,000 uh, patients. And then it's estimated to even increase. We are going to need about 4.3 million doctors by 2033 because the population is increasing. We need to build more capacity, but the population of Africa is just increasing exponentially. So the need for access to healthcare is going to literally double. And different countries have started to use AI to contribute to this gap. In Rwanda, there's a tool called Babil. I think I visited this team in, in Chigali where they're using a digital consulting service with an AI powered chatbot that provides healthcare advice and symptoms and diagnosis through a mobile app. And then depending on the severity, you then come in to either see a clinician and then go on with your next steps of care. But it's a good screening tool for somebody. We know that the mobile phone penetration in Africa is about 90% or more. So with such a tool, you can easily have access to, um, to healthcare. And I don't know if there's somebody from Rwanda here to tell us the experience. Then you have Rocket Health in Uganda. This is also a telemedicine that sprung, uh, that you know, became even more useful during COVID-19 where medicine is delivered, like, Lab, uh, lab, lab specimens are collected in-house and they're improving delivery of medical care. Drugs are dispatched to clients in different catchment areas and the whole telemedicine has actually grown um, more in Uganda. Then there's Crib MD. I'm pretty sure the sample from Nigeria here will tell us about this. It's a telemedical solutions that supports doctor home visits through digital uh, outreach. And this company again is increasing healthcare. You're in your home. You can use uh, this telemedicine digital platform to talk about your symptoms and then you get um, access to medical interpretation or care through the online uh, medical doctors or doctor visits through this tele uh, teleservice. Then there's Health Force in South Africa. It's a web-based that tool that enables nurses to improve their clinical care with the support of a remote general, remote general practitioner. So because of task shifting, some roles are passed on to nurses, but in some countries, the number of nurses are also very few. And sometimes you need to, nurses will need to consult a GP or a doctor with particular health decisions. So this tele, this web-based app helps nurses get linked to uh, GPs and that way the health decisions are made faster and there's more access to care. The Dogspot Health in Egypt, it's a startup that helps uh, connect patients in Middle East and Africa with leading international experts online. So it's also another tool that's being used out there. It's MDOC, this is Nigerian. Uh, it's a startup which provides people with chronic disease with access to integrated care support through mobile and web apps. So again, managing chronic diseases are becoming increasingly high in Africa because of the increased uh, life expectancy. So you can see these innovations around the application of AI to increase healthcare in different African countries. In terms of health education, we've also seen AI being used to increase health literacy. Uh, we know particularly when it comes to sexual, maternal and child healthcare in Africa still remains behind. When you look at the, the number of women who have who attend four of the recommended antenatal, antenatal visits in Africa, it's less than 50, between 50%, only one in two women will complete all the four recommended antenatal visits. So there's still 35% of women in Africa access at least one ANC, and then 13% of women in Africa have no access to antenatal visits, but they have phones. So if you have a phone, you use digital technology. This has been rolled out in Cameroon. The mobile app called Gifted Mom uh, helps creates a platform using AI and machine learning to provide women with vital health information, reminders to go to healthcare facilities, of course, with different uh, other healthcare access issues. But I think, but but I know that these tools already improve reminders, access to healthcare, and a woman can remember to go to the healthcare, receive a contraceptive, they get uh, access to maternal education, reminders for hospital appointments and fertility tips throughout the pregnancy and post period. So these are, again, this is in Cameroon and leveraging the power of AI. 
This I already talked about, but it was misinformation during COVID-19. But on the right in Makerere University AI lab, they have mined <clears throat> radio data from radio stations in different parts of the country, mined this data, and they've been able to come up with uh, strategies, understand what the community is talking about, and be able to uh, be able to package the way information about COVID was going on in the communities. That's also AI. In Rwanda, we've seen the use of AI for improving medical supplies. There's a company called Zipline. I don't know how many of you have heard about it. it trans it's really used for blood delivery, particularly in remote areas where it's the terrain of Rwanda is hard to navigate, but the drones are AI driven and um, AI supported drones to deliver drugs at different pickup points. And they're saving a lot of uh, maternal death and childhood mortality because of the drones. In Uganda, there is um, a drone technology being used to deliver antiretroviral therapy. And again, this is the power of AI by the team called Academy for Health Innovation. So in terms of health system strengthening, we are seeing a lot of uh, AI as well. Globally, we know that about 200 billion worth of counterfeit drugs affects Africa. And this is contributes to around 42% of the budget. Annually, 250,000 children die from counterfeit drugs and malaria for, for malaria and, and pneumonia. So this application MP degree that is in Nigeria helps to scan medical drug records. You can verify your drug before you take it through a counterfeit AI driven algorithm and then be able to, <coughs> to assess whether your drug is is counterfeit or, or real. And then this has actually reduced uh, counterfeit drugs in Nigeria, according to literature, from 30 to 10%. But the people here can tell us more about that. So that's also a bit of um, AI being used to finance healthcare systems for healthcare financing. Only 8% of women in Africa have access to health insurance. With this uh, Wella Health AI is an AI powered uh, chatbot. It provides health insurance to low middle income Nigerian households. And uh, the, you know, it provides what is the best insurance policy based on the budget. And it has helped to prevent simple diseases like malaria and typhoid and provides a cash back for hospital days. So this, all these are innovations that are using AI in different parts of Africa. In terms of training, AI is also powerful. We've seen uh, virtual reality that is being used to train uh, preclinical students in preclinical medical training. You can now visualize cadavers or use VR to support exploration of different human anatomy. And this is really taking shape and helping a lot of uh, AI training for medical students in, in Africa. This is in Macquarie University with the AI visualization lab at Macquarie University. So AI is playing a big role in uh, public health. It's been used to apply, uh, it's applied in disease prevention, health promotion, and also curing different diseases in Africa. And the power of AI cannot be underestimated. Of course, it's being used sometimes in very upstream health systems but there's need to strengthen this capacity in different health systems if the functionalities and the systems are in place. Most of the times it is driven through um, projects and uh, mainly through private for profit and non-for-profit sector. So it also calls on the fact that maybe these, in, these innovations need to be expanded from micro projects to national systems, but they have changed status quo in improving healthcare outcomes at scale, sometimes they are not really widespread because most of these innovations are not uh, being rolled out in public health systems. But we can share a couple of examples where you think AI has been rolled out in your different public health systems, but they still remain at micro level. And, this, and they are also occurring in some countries that have done some investments in uh, underlying research and development uh, capabilities in the different countries. So there's a lot of application. However, we need to make sure that they can have a substantial impact in Africa. There's need for investment in infrastructure, high-speed internet, train the capacity. That's why you guys are being trained. Help to use the data to develop these last mile products that are going to improve public health. You need to invest in the skill sets that are scientists, that are modelers, analysts, healthcare workers to critique the tools, know 
how to, you know, to understand how the data, how the tools are developed, look at the data that is that are developed, how are generalizable, what are the biases, and we need this skill set if we are to roll out increased data analytical capacity and its last my products in Africa. In terms of concerns, yes, there are concerns in how uh, AI should be handled. There is, um, in countries where there's not very strict regulatory and, leg and legislative frameworks on data governance, AI can, can choose to be a pro can choose to be, it might be a problem. So it needs to be rolled out with caution, make sure that the tools, the innovations, the web apps are developed with the right manner, with the right data set, they can be controlled through the in-country regulatory uh, systems. They are legally, they are legally protected and they're using the right data. And then uh, one of the things also need to, to be careful about when we are rolling out most of this AI is that there is power asymmetry. Sometimes the AI are driven by profit-making companies at the expense of the immediate benefit from where the data are being collected. Sometimes they are rolled in different parts, but there is no benefit where the data are actually collected. That they are unaffordable because of their nature by profit-driven companies. So there is need to really balance that power symmetry when we are rolling out uh, AI. Then the data gaps, we've already talked about this, the data really needs to be generalizable. They need to take care of the different age structure in the country, in the continent, the geography, the epidemiology of the disease that they are targeting. All these need to be addressed. And uh, lastly, in countries where there's a lot of um, high employment, I think there was a paper that came out last week around you know, and um, generative AI and unrestricted AI, how is it going to change, impact employment in different parts of the world? If we are seeing robots taking over certain jobs that were uh, conducted by humans, what is the future in countries where the unemployment is still very high and how do we account for that as we roll out these different uh, tools? And then in summary, it's important to use AI in public health it must be considered, but it should be done at wider scale up at national level if it's to impact different, uh, if it's to impact, make, if it's to have meaningful impact, it needs to be rolled out at larger scale from project to maybe nation led uh, scale up. And of course, this takes a lot of steps in there the systems, the data, the investment, the skill set, but preferably all these AI tools should should be uh, should 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 benefit everyone if we are to see an impact on public health we need to make sure that there are investments in the data systems in the infrastructure the skills and and the capabilities to analyze and develop these tools so there is need to be a different pipeline of analysts of 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 data and particularly analysts who are going to be able to roll out these tools maintain them, critique them, and make sure that they are appropriate to the settings that they are being developed. And then the goal of any health system is equity. It must be the heart, at the heart of developing any AI tools on the continent. If we are to roll out these tools, they need to be accessible to everyone, not in different populations. And that's where the whole agenda of equity comes in and making sure that they are not in a, Select, not only usable by selected clusters of the population. And then lastly, they need to make sure that they are embedded in the national health system. If you're creating a tool that is digitalizing or providing uh, telemedicine to certain groups that can afford it, those data, the records should then be integrated into the existing national health systems so that that data is also captured. And that way the tool is, um, J is, is, is used in the whole um, national health system, national health system structures that provide data for the at country level. And then, like the title said, it's not too little that has been done. There's a lot more, but we cannot complain. I think just to know that for us to roll out uh, more of these AI tools to use data, we need to really, really increase the capacity and uh, make sure that we can work with certain countries that had, you know, have put their foot forward in terms of investing in AI and maybe work with those and see how that can be scaled up to different regions or different countries in Africa. But just to say that um, it's promising, 
And as data people, as people who are going to look at this data, develop these algorithms, create these innovations, we need to know that whatever we're developing needs to benefit more than a small population. And the benefits are far, uh, far out, that the benefits outweigh the risks of the data that is shared, but also that the tools make an impact really on the, on the healthcare system in the African context. So I thought this talk is important for you as you embark on this five weeks journey of learning how to analyze epidemiology, you know, data modeling and whatever course units that you're going to do at the back of the mind, whatever we're developing should at least make an impact in the lives, contribute to policy and make sure that benefits uh, the different countries from where we are doing these analysis. So I'm going to pause here very briefly uh, for any reactions or comments, any experiences in your different countries where AI has impacted public health as I load the next presentation around uh, making this data fair and uh, standardized to support most of these data science projects. So um, I welcome, the mic is open, anybody who wants to chip in here, who has some questions and, uh, and 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 any any feedback? I see some chats here around. In Ghana, we have Zipline. Okay, it says Zipline is a drone delivery system for delivery. All right, in how to reach population. So Zipline, it actually Zipline is in Ghana as well. Uh, what else? Which other countries have some cool AI apps or applications? South Africa should have several. So any experiences here on how? AI has uh, contributed to better healthcare in your different countries. What are the challenges? What are the experiences here? And how is it working? The floor is open. No one. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure here in Zimbabwe um, the actual name of the AI program, but I think medical doctors are already using um, uh, some AI application to diagnose diseases. Um, I, I, I don't have a certainty uh, with regards to the well, the name of uh, the, the application being used. Mm. So they are using a, a tool to diagnose diseases, just like the, the MDOC in, in Nigeria. So they define the disease and then they get care on the phone? Or yeah, uh, basically, uh, basically uh, they, are, uh, they use medical images uh, where they uh, then uh, it helps them uh, to diagnose uh, diseases, especially with regards to cancer and heart diseases. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, with regards to public health, I'm, I'm not. I, I'm not saying this with uh, a total certainty. No. Okay. Is it my internet? Okay, that's already a public health application out there. Um. Uh, medical imaging and how these are rolling out uh, and improving healthcare. Any other feedback? What did the break do to you guys? <laughs> Very quiet. Okay, hello. Yes. Yes. So I think uh, now, as you have even presented, I believe in Ghana here to, you know, artificial intelligence, AI has been used in, in our health, uh, healthcare system in Ghana here. So with issues of predictive analytics. Mm. Now, we, I know there are some studies ongoing to look at how we can implement 
or use some predictors that in, uh, some predictors on uh, or in in prayer clubs here to see if we can develop such uh, or that we can test those predictors clinically to identify pregnant women who may be at risk for for prayer clubs here. And then once we're able to recognize them at early stages for prayer clubs here with the necessary intervention or management, they can be managed. And then the pregnancy will be saved. They will deliver and then the, the mother and the baby to, you know, the complications that may be associated with it will, will reduce. Okay, so they create like a risk profile based on if you had to predict who is at risk of preeclampsia. Yes, yes. Okay. Excellent. Um, is there any other feedback or should we move to the next slide? Um, hello, good morning. Morning, Ivan. Um, so in as much as AI has um, been very beneficial when it comes to her, uh, public health outcomes, there are still some challenges when it comes to um, AI. Mm -hmm. um, there are some um, school of thought that says that when it comes to um, a fiscal assessment, um, AI kind of um, is not able to do or give a very accurate fiscal assessment of individuals, hence causing um, misdiagnosis of most of these conditions. Um, so I don't know whether it's really prudent uh, if um, we could still further go on to um, improve upon some of these features um, in, in, in um, AI. I don't know your thoughts on that. Thank you. Uh, yes, of course, <laughs> that, I mean, there's, there's only so much that the machines do because one of the arguments around AI is to keep the human in the loop. Because the machine depends a lot on the intelligence of the human and uh, the human brain. So you clearly they can, they only learn from what they are given. But there was an interesting study, I think about two months ago, where the, the, uh, they rolled out an AI assistant uh, screening tool compared to, I think it was a consultation in the US where they, rolled out but patients called in either to a robot or to an in-person um, nurse or a healthcare provider and they were being uh, you know talking about their symptoms sharing their symptoms and the feedback that was received from the AI tool if I'm trying to remember was when they asked the when they asked the the participants the patients what they preferred some didn't even know they were talking to an AI to a robot but at the end of the day the tool performed better the 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 robot performed better in terms of feedback diagnosing uh, many of the different illnesses we've seen ai some of these we've seen chat gpt sitting some of the medical exams in the us or the legal exams and you know performing outsmarting humans so there's this there's, there's the power of it is also risky but it still depends on a lot of human, but I know that in certain aspects, for example, like, you know, consultation or clacking, those are things that I think are going to still remain largely uh, uh, human driven, limited human driven, I think with a lot of uh, robotic assistance, but I don't think that will reach, well, we might, I, I don't know, I might not be here, but it should be a point where almost all tasks are largely driven by machines. Hopefully it's not too soon, but yes, it has its limitations because it only learns from the data that you feed uh, the computer and it builds and strengthens itself better and better. We've seen chat GPT always getting plugs in different uh, AI chatbots and you know different tools out there that are being developed every day because of the data that is being used to train them and making them better and better every day. So there's still a lot to learn and a lot of caution, uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's something that we are living with. But I see Kerry, Kerry Ann, I see your, your hand up. Um, Over. Yes. Um, thank you for that presentation. I am tuning in from Jamaica. And with all this talk around AI and a point that was mentioned earlier, 
I was thinking that, you know, how are we going to make or what thoughts or ideas are there to make the integration integration of AI into the healthcare system, you know, affordable for us low and middle income countries. In Jamaica, we mostly use like paper records. We don't have digitized medical records. If we do, that's in private hospital facilities. And if we do have like the online medical care, um, it's really accessible to those who can afford it. So how would this approach to like tune using more AI and um, more technology be affordable for the masses? Any thoughts around that? Good question. I'll open it up. Uh, I see a lot of um, activities in the chat. Uh, Dr. Kathika, what is your experience? We are talking about smartwatches, different tools that monitor our sleep, our wealth, our, you know, how are these going to be accessible to people who cannot afford them in LMICs? I think we can get some contributions here. It's a challenge, clearly. There is need for investment, but at the same time, investment in some of these technologies. So you need to see the return on investment. If a country is to roll out some of these tools, what is the you know what is the return on investment? If I'm developing or expanding this app that will prevent so many maternal deaths in the next five years, maybe the governments need to refocus and say we have to have this port that is dedicated to rolling out AI to reach the last mile, to reach everybody in the community. But it's it's a very huge ask in countries where there's a lot of competing interests in LMICs, uh, competing priorities, different disasters that come up every day, and the priorities to focus on technology vis-a-vis -vis, uh, pressing public health demands. But I guess, the power is for the analysts now to say, look, if you invest in this app and you're preventing 250,000 deaths per year, maybe it's time to focus that investment in some of the some of the technology that is going to improve healthcare. But I'll be happy to see what um, people here on the chat think in the group think about how do we roll out? How do we get them from Unaccessible to affordable populations in LMICs. What we need to do, and how do we engage the policymakers to embrace data-supported uh, outputs? Yes, Eddie. Yes. So I will say that first we have to look at it for the advocacy uh, point of view to let policy makers really buy into the need to use artificial intelligence in our healthcare system. Like as we, we, we've started, you know, through this training, it's also a form of creating more like an awareness or advocating for the use. So we that we are now get we are even having the training now. At the end of the day, what we should be we should be able to do is to also push for the implementation, okay, in any way that we 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 can in our facilities or wherever our organizations start talking to top uh, management, pushing, letting them understand the need that now if we don't move or this is the trend that we have to, and these are the need, you know, uh, or these are the importance of artificial intelligence uh, in our healthcare system. Once they're able to understand the need, I know there'll be, or I believe there'll be some commitment in uh, moving away from the paper base that uh, Zekari Ann, you know, said uh, she, they, they are witnessing in, in, in Jamaica. So with the advocacy, I know we'll be able to make a point and then the policymakers will then begin to, you know, channel or look at how they are going to mobilize some of the resources in funding uh, artificial intelligence or even in data science in general in, in our healthcare system. Yes, I think one of the points you say is um, the advocacy. And it cannot come without the products being 
generated without us, you know, researchers, data producers, data analysts sitting at the same table with um, policy record, policy makers and making that advocacy say, look, this, and I think one of the things that is also coming up is the need to add an economic interpretation for some of these uh, AI innovations. If you do an, an app and you don't get the economic, you know, um, equivalent of how many lives it saves, or the number of, um, you know, the, the, num the, 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 the total amount of funds that are saved, the dollars that are saved, or whatever unit you want to use, if this, um, if this, if this, this tool is rolled out, then people who make these policies or people who invest in the different national budgets can know instead of investing in this, I can then uh, be able to be able to uh, be able to roll this tool out because it's going to save this number of, 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 of lives, it's going to save this amount of money. So I think advocacy is, 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 is just at the forefront of everything. And we have to, we have to step out of the code that we do and then meet with policymakers and make an, an impact and spread the gospel of what we've done with the data and make them understand and maybe hopefully invest. But it's, it's a long shot that needs a lot of uh, multi-sectoral approach from the treasury to the finance, to the planners and a lot, of, uh, a lot of investment and a lot of discussions at higher levels needs to happen. But I think as our role as uh, on the data actors is to make the reality, sorry, make, create the evidence and then from there uh, create advocacy for the tools that we create. Um, I see some information here in the chat. Uh, Frontline, there, there comes the importance of frontline health workers where they can deliver necessary requirements in cases when the resources are limited. I think this is, a, this is mobile health system strengthening approach. Can health workers be trained on the necessary basic direction of techniques of common diseases? And we've seen a lot of advances around, um, you know, making these tools very, very user-friendly to people who are non-tech. So if we can be able to roll out some of these, get them to be done or used by different uh, levels of staff in the healthcare systems, then maybe you reach, um, you reach the community faster and they have a better uptake. So there's a lot of advocacy needed there. Uh, most sub Saharan Africa do not invest in R&D and that is critically limits the buy-in and ownership of research outcomes. Yes, yes, I think these are very policy level decisions because if countries don't invest in R&D, then you might as well do your models. But so there's a lot, there's a gap between a lot of the innovations done in Africa and moving them up to scale. That is where most of the challenge is because the government won't use them the fund has only funded the project for a particular uh, duration. These tools are developed with data and then that is it. They end at development. Some are the end of the stages of prototypes. Some are not scaled up. So I think you see why some partners can call grant and say this is only for innovations that have already uh, been developed. You're moving, you know, scale, scaling projects because there's a lot of innovations that remain on the bench or in the uh, in the pipeline in Africa. So on other LMICs, I won't even generalize it to Africa, and other LMICs, and there's need for taking them from that stage to the scale up. And generally, governments need to invest in a nutshell, and advocacy needs to happen at all stages. Uh, so Gwendolyn says, apart from resources, and also in in line with advocacy, it's also important to get buy-in from community members. So work hand in hand with community leaders, the community members who would actually make use of the products. Yes, I, uh, that's a good point. Thank you, Gwendolyn, because uh, we've seen countries where innovations are developed, but they, they are not embraced. In some parts of, um, uh, some parts of LMICs, I'll give an example, I'm from Uganda, malaria remains the number one cause of death, despite huge, huge, huge investments in malaria 
in some communities in, in malaria prevention, you still find uh, some communities not using mosquito nets and yet they are provided. So the same thing goes to technology. If you pre develop these cool you know, applications, but they are not embraced by the community, then they become useless. They are rendered useless because they won't, they won't take them up. But it just goes back to the whole data cycle and the whole point of investing in Africa's public health, but recognizing the diversity. If you are to develop apps instead of blanket innovations, you need to go down to the country specific uh, teams, find out what is most critical, what is needed, what is the urgent need, and then develop the tool that way uh, you then have probably more buying, get community members when you bring prototypes of these innovations, let them test the apps, let them give you comments, create community advisory boards that review the innovations and the plans so that when the tools are ready for scale, you can then go back to the community and say, yes, this is the tool we developed, you asked for it and help us promote it. So there is, there is um, there's a lot of, um, need to deal with the community. Um, if we're using technology like different app to collect data and store in it, in that case, we'll have outliers. How can we uh, overcome that? I think we'll go back to that about the outliers, but we talked about that. Uh, I'll just, the acceptance issues and low utilization even after introducing. Yes, I think work with the community from the start. Don't just, Paracute and jump, come up with these uh, <laughs> innovations. You have to work with the communities where you're going to test them, increase their knowledge, and um, make them understand the value of what tools that you are developing. Due to lack of knowledge and practice to use it, yes, you need to train the community. In many communities, there are community health workers, at least in LMICs. You find community champions or health champions or community uh, village health teams. And these are the community at the grassroots dealing with basic to health um, uh, innovation. So these are also, they, they need to be your go-to people if you are to develop the right tools and, and be able to use, to use them at community level. And, and uh, yeah, make sure that they're embraced. There's also, I'm reading Stephen Akar, you say there is the need to engage the regional organizations like Africa CDC, ECOWAS, Africa ETC, who will in turn engage ministries of health in member states. Research institutions have a great role to play in this regard. Correct, if you read the Agenda 2063 of Africa, I don't know how many of you have read it. I think one of the pillars is strengthening uh, community health workers working with the different national public health institutes to promote uh, all the different uh, innovations. So I guess these governing bodies like the AU, Africa CDC, need to also work with the different ministries, like you said, Stephen. Train capacity, we have a project that's training about um, uh, training researchers in the different national public health institutes in Africa. And what we are seeing is there's a lot of capacity that needs to be passed on. There's a lot of aspects of research, making them understand the power of sharing the data at ministry level, using it for data-driven solutions. And when we have the, you know, the buy-in from the bigger regional bodies, it becomes easier. So yes, that's a good point. We need to work. All this process has to be, again, the good thing that Africa CTC is now evolving, the science offices are developing, the public health agendas are out there. So I think it's right time to engage um, such bodies to make sure that we are engaging with the right team and police and institutions that will embrace the innovations. And then there is potential to utilize the legislature to enhance acceptance. Parliament play a critical role in building awareness to and monitoring utilization. Correct. Uh, we need to we need to work with politicians. At the end of the day, politicians make many of the decisions that govern a country. So, if you're rolling out your tool, make sure you have a member of parliament or someone or chief administrative at local levels to you know to 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 
to embrace the outputs of your project and the innovations that come. So there's a lot of policy engagement that I'm hearing from all the chats. We need to engage policy and make sure that they are they are they have the buy-in and they can support the the researchers and data analysts or um yeah researchers in the different tools that are developed and the strategies. Edim, is this a new hand or it's your old hand? Okay. All right. Is there any other feedback or can we move to the next? Yes, it's a, a, a new hand. So oh, new I one. wanted okay. to, yeah, yeah, I wanted to also add that, you know, there are some free uh, apps that we can use in our local settings. And then based on that, we will be able to gather good data. Okay, through research, we gather good data and then make a case why there is a need to go or to digitalize most of the things that we do in our various facilities. So if let's say currently you your facility, you don't have the resources to 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 uh, to go a full for uh, digitalization to gather or to collect data. What you mm -hmm. can do is to look look around for the most of the, the the free access to see how you can maximize such the, uh, such uh, applications and then gather data and then use it to address some you know important challenges in your institution and then based on that you can use it you know to make a case or an argument a need for for that institution or for even your community or country based on the, the data that you collect, how rich it will be, and you can use it to make the case that, yes, you know, guys, it is time for us to go, you know, for whole digitalization to reduce uh, these cases or that cases. Yes, I think with this, we will be able to make a headway in using artificial intelligence or data science in general in, 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 uh, in Africa or in low and middle income countries. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Edim. And I think it rains back to uh, Kofi's uh, remarks when he was starting. You guys are going to be the champions for this. The skills that you get from here are what will be used to increase advocacy for data use, different ways of collecting data, different ways of analyzing data, the results from all modeling activities, how they impact different health outcomes, so it's what I'm hearing is we also have to play a part, show with evidence the value of the new ways of doing business. And then uh, that way you can convince uh, the policymakers or larger institutions to uptake the advances in data analytics and um, AI as, as a whole. So uh, with that, I want to give you the last presentation that I had, and it's really about this discussion of making data fair. Again, it's an introduction to help us know the aspects of, um, of data sharing and making data findable and advances around standardizing data. It will be a short presentation, then we should have finished in the next 30 minutes, then we can call it a day. So let me load my screen. Okay, uh, so I want to just change the discussion here around um, sharing of, uh, around the application of AI, but to go a little bit deeper into, okay, as if we are to develop all these tools, we need data. Where do we find the data? In what format? How can we standardize it? How can we contribute to a large collaborative uh, projects? And we know that, that with this big data, we saw the different attributes of big data. We need, we, we need lots of data. I don't, I, about a, a month ago, a student came to me and said, I have a hundred, I have a sample size of a hundred. Can I do a data science project? 
and I, you know, I not to discourage them, but I, 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 we need more data. We need big data sets to come up with algorithms that are developed with large, uh, large data points that can be comfortably, you know, separated in training and testing and can come up with models that are more accurate and not subject to precision based on a small sample size. So, um, so because of that, we need to understand how do we create, do we increase knowledge around standardizing data to contribute to larger projects? How do we make this data uh, findable as we roll on, uh, as we continue to use data science and different analytical methods out there to improve public health. So I'll just talk about introduction to data standardization, a little bit about the Odyssey, which is a very common uh, platform for standardizing data, and then uh, types of common data models, the tools for data standardization, introduction to data, and frameworks for making data fair. So let's move all this together. So one of what we do currently is when you have a data set, for example, you want to study the effect of drug, let me say drug X on let's say depression, or how do people adhere to a particular drug? So it's a user, it's a use case or a research question that you have. You then go ahead and develop that that tool, create your code, I use this you know, one study, it might be big enough, but you create code with that uh, study specific to that study and then apply it to your data. But what is happening now, if we're in a platform where we can comfortably share data or you can replicate that study in a different country. You find another country will answer the same question with a different data set, different variables, almost similar, you know, a code or a analytic code or whatever script you're writing, but apply to different countries. And at the end of the day, we can get aggregated results or we can synthesize from different countries. But if you're thinking of it as um, a project, and you have to do it in different countries. You need to, to take care of the differences in where the different countries the data are collected, the different infrastructure, the way you're writing the code that's specific to that country. And we always use this example of a flat iron. If you traveled with this flat iron to different countries, uh, let's say North America, it, it probably would fit. In, uh, South, in South Asia, it wouldn't fit. So if it's a code, it wouldn't work for a different country. In China, that would be different. Europe, so you can see the diversity of different countries. Uh, if you to if you are to apply that same use case question to a different country, you need to repurpose the code, look at the different variables, different scripts, unity, and there to make sure that you, you're getting almost uh, harmonized results for the same research question. So that's the current situation where uh, research questions sometimes are analyzed in just one study with one code, but we are moving towards, um, so that's the thing, you have to write a different code for a different country and make sure that it works in the different settings. And because of that, sometimes it's not scalable. If it was a flat iron, you have to have different codes for different, different questions. If you're tweaking a do file, maybe in stata, it has to be manipulated to fit the different variables in all the different data sets. Sometimes it's not scalable. It might end up not being transparent. It's expensive. It's slow, and um, and if you were to replicate this, it becomes a bit difficult in certain settings. So data standardization it enables. Let's get all these things here. It enables. Um, sorry. Oh God, turn it again. Sorry about that. I need to share again. Okay. So data standardization helps us to answer the same questions 
with a unified code in different settings. And to do this, you need to have your data standardized. For example, if in, in, in Ghana, you, collect, you, collected, uh, you, know, you collected variables in a data set and maybe household was, um, was labeled as HHB, as H, HHB, maybe that's the variable name. And then in, 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 in Zimbabwe, almost similar data set, but the variable of a household is labeled differently. When you standardize this, when you standardize this data, sorry, there's somebody fixing something in that neighbor. I hope it doesn't distract us. So when you standardize this data, and uh, have a common data model, which we'll see shortly, you're able to roll out the same script in different, different data sets. Sorry, let me try and move. Challenges of working from home. So a neighbor is fixing something. Okay, so I was saying the value of standardizing this data is to have the same script variables can be unified across different uh, data sources, and you have the ability to run different questions with the same with the same code, but different data sets in different settings, and that is the principle for standardizing data. And there are a lot of tools out there, and these are really introduction tools. And I urge you if it is something that is important to you to start to read more about harmonizing data, standardizing data, what are the common data models out there. I don't know how many of you have heard about this concept, but they're increasingly becoming uh, something that allows for collaborative research. And one of the tools that we'll see is the OMOP, which is a, a common data model that is out there. So analytics can be remote because the standards are the same. When you use the same script, you can remain in Ghana or remain in Zanzibar or sorry, in Zimbabwe or Jamaica, use the same code, but it's being run on similar data sets that are being standardized. And uh, the same data in different countries can be, can be run on the same code. You remain with the, uh, the ability to compare your results with different countries, but the sovereignty of the data remains where the data is produced. And there are always firewalls that protect some of the data sets that are shared out there. So that's that's kind of the principle of standardizing data. And it's not a new concept in many parts of the world, a lot of standardization is happening, only that in many parts, in many countries in Africa, we are not doing most of the, uh, we're not using internationally recognized standardized models for standardizing uh, healthcare data. So one of the, common, one of, one of the models that are out there that are being used to standardize health data is the Odyssey, which is Observational Health Data Sciences and Informatics. It's, uh, it was developed in the US, but the vision is to improve health by empowering a community to collaboratively generate the evidence that promotes better health decisions and better care. It's a, it's a world in which observational research produces a comprehensive understanding of health and disease. That is really their mission. But if you look at the dots, again, like many dots in, of the world, uh, there are not very many collaborators in Africa. And for many reasons, because data sharing has so many challenges in Africa, data collection, some data is still in hard, in paper-based records, systems that allow this uh, standardization of data. The skill set also remains lacking. But you can see that the Odyssey tools uh, that have been rolled out largely in the US, we have about uh, 74 countries that are collaborating using these standards. However, in Africa, this is still really, really, really underestimated. At the PHRC, we are doing a lot of work around creating advocacy for standardizing data, at least in the African context. Can we share data? Can we standardize data that is coming in for Africa? Can we look at some of these vocabularies and see if we need to modify them for the data that is generated on the continent or other LMICs that needs to be fine-tuned. But we can see that there's a lot of um, need to increase ability to standardize our data. And I thought that this is something that I could introduce you to and maybe learn more how to do that. 
So as we as we start um, to to talk more about uh, standardization, there are some concepts around um, creating a data model. For standardization, really depends on creating a model that is similar. What are the type type of the models that are out there? and the desirable outputs of real world evidence. How do we create common data models and how do we structure the data to fit some of these models? And this is work that we are doing as part of a large network called Inspire that we can I can talk to you later more about. So in terms of the journey to real world evidence from our data, we have this patient level data. And for here, it might be data from a, a study, or data from a health facility. And you need to make sure that you move from that data in a database or a study or a system to reliable evidence that can impact care. So that is where we ideally want to move. But there are different types of data sets. We have data coming in from different populations, pediatric versus elderly, uh, socioeconomic disparities. We've had a question of how do you roll out these AI tools in different parts of the community. There are different healthcare settings, some are inpatient, some are outpatient, different different uh, data capture processes, some are healthcare records, we talked about these, some are clinical registries, some are administrative claims from insurance, and then there's a healthcare system uh, this, uh, diversity, some patients are insured, some are not insured, so there's a lot of diversity when you're looking at patient level data being generated in LMISs and other settings, but we need to move this data standardize it so that we can create um, reliable evidence. And the way to do that is to work towards what is called harmonizing the data, create a cohort uh, that can be defined, characterize the clinical population, estimate some of the population level uh, effects of this data, and also do some patient level prediction with the data sets. That is how we can we'll generate reliable evidence with the data that we have. However, we need what is to do this, we need something called a data model. And uh, a model is really a representation of typically, you know, data typically collected about many things. In this context, we are restricting it to uh, the examples I've given to maybe hospital records, but it can be anything. Um, it can be data from events or relationships and just trying to look at how the two correlate and how you can then standardize them to, to, to to, to fit a particular framework that you want. So it's 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 like a, a representation of data really and the information that goes around that data set. So there are different types of data models. However, for this uh for this for this session, I'll just talk very briefly about the common data model, because this is what is really used for um for what is used by the Odyssey group and what is commonly used now in many parts of the world to start to help us learn to standardize our data. There are different models you can look up, you, you can read up, but the common data model is what I'll focus on now. It is a standardized model that is used to represent and manage observational healthcare data. And we've seen it being rolled out in many parts of the world, but increasingly the need to see some of these data models used in LMICs is, is becoming apparent. So for us to have the standardization complete, we need to have data structures, data put in different structures, which we already have tables. You know, we need to have this structure laid out to, to build this um, model properly. We need to know the protocols that were put in place when the data were generated, the vocabularies or terminologies that are, that are attached to this clinical data. I, I'm, I'm hearing different um, from the chat and the discussions. I can see many people here have knowledge about clinical data. So there are codes like the ICD-10, the International Code of Death. Those are kind of vocabularies that can be leveraged for uh, these common data as you standardize your data. Then there is aspects around uh, cohort definition. What if you're to develop an algorithm, how do you identify the patients who meet the criteria for a particular outcome or particular study in a different interval of time? You need to look at the variables that are going to be included in the statistical analysis, the tools, the procedures to produce the aggregate summary statistics, and then how do you report these statistics in this whole channel of standardizing data. So the common data model is uh, used to standardize an exchange to pull data, to share, store data from multiple sources. 
it can be rolled out in different countries, different uh, different settings. But what is most important is you have to specify the structure, the format, and the other content to be pulled or shared in the data that you're sharing. So once you have this patient level data, remember I wanted to go to evidence generation. If you have this uh, patient level common data model from different sources, you can harmonize all your studies into this one format and be able to generate evidence from multiple sources that create for you a big data set that you can come up with algorithms that are uh, very that uh, that that have the right precision and power and the sample size to come up with all these algorithms. So this is just a, a blueprint of what the common data model looks like. And again, this whole point is to introduce you very briefly. I'm, I'm pretty sure somebody has already seen this, but the ODC community has created this version where if you have data, for example, ID in your data set, you named it as ID, you then map it to this common data model. And here it comes and sits under the person identifier. If it's a visit, you map it to that field in the common data model. If it's a drug, there's already um, a vocabulary that is attached to it or a concept that maps the different variables in your data set to this standard blueprint that is called the common data model. And you can then standardize your variables, come up with metadata, and we'll see what metadata are, map it with different international recognized standards, and then be able to harmonize your data and make it contribute to a bigger community of collaborative researchers and collaborative data uh, activities that are out there. You can do it within country and harmonize your data, maybe harmonize all the data in a different country, harmonize the health facility data instead of it sitting in one setting, make sure you analyze maybe the data from all public health facilities in Ghana and then have a large data set that you can use to do data science driven projects. So why the common data model? I think it's been proved to, uh, it, can, it can be used by uh, cross institutional collaborations. You can write one program if the data is standardized and then used on different multiple data sets and be able to come up with, um, uh, with um, outcomes or products or results that can inform the bigger picture. If you know your data, you can convert it to, to a common data model. If you know the problem with your data, you can extract, transform, and load it. That is a whole process of standardizing data. And the whole community of researchers have access to aggregate data from your settings. It can be represented in different diverse organizations. And that way you're contributing to um, uh, some of these processes. And you're using standardized tools like those that are already out there by the ODC community. Common data models bring consistency to observational research through standardizing of many of its com components. And uh, they've been leveraged. And most of these are actually free software that are out there for, for harmonizing this data. And at the end of the day, we are moving towards open science in Africa. I will skip this, but it's the same principle. You harmonize your data, create, extract, transform, and load. That is ETL. Standardize it in different uh, containers in the common data model and then uh, be able to run collaborative analysis. So that's just exactly what I've been saying. And you can, most of these processes are uh, guarded. There are some firewalls to ensure uh, protection of the data and, uh, and that between your data set and the OMOP, the Odyssey tools, there's, there's a lot of protection to make sure that the data are protected. But this is exactly a lot of systems to protect the data. And these are types of different, you know, these are different data sets that they can all be harmonized using OMOP or the common data model, run a single query, and that way you can do a large collaborative analysis from different tools. And just to mention a few of the tools that are used out there when you're harmonizing data, there's one called uh, White Rabbit, and the other one is called Rabbit in a Hat. I know the name sounds a bit uh, funny, but those are the tools that are used for standardizing data. And you can check them out if you're interested in this field as you build your career, because it's a growing field and there are not many people in Africa who are using standardized tools for their data. Again, this is exactly what I'm saying. You can use, uh, you get uh, the data experts to meet with the, experts in, com in standardization, you create, you extract, transform, and load, that is the ETL. 
You can do that with right rabbit, rabbit in a heart. Then you share it with medical domain experts to look at the codes you've created. And this can be done with tools like Osagi. And then you then move on again to um, quality control, creating this ETL process again. Once you're done as a technical person, you create these ETLs and then be able to analyze the data at a global level and contribute to um, standardized data. So that's just the process. And these are the same tools I've said again, white rabbit, rabbit in a hat that are uh, used for harmonizing and standardizing data. In the next five minutes, I'll talk to you very briefly about making data fair, uh, that is findable, accessible, and interoperable and reusable. And I think many of you have had it, but uh, I'll summarize the slides in five minutes so that you at least leave here with an idea of the exact steps that are always taken when you're making your data fair. And there are very many principles around making data fair. And uh, you might want to follow some domains that are out there. You want to take care of where the data is collected, the social environment where the data are collected. But these principles, again, need to be harmonized with what is out there, what people are using for making their data findable and fair. So in terms of uh, how you make data fair, you have to work largely with what we call two, two data points. One is the actual data itself, and two is the metadata. And here I try to explain what is data and what is metadata. And I think many of you have heard about it, but I can just go through. If you're making data fair, you're making the actual individual level data fair. You also have to make the metadata that the attributes of that data fair and findable. If somebody wants to find a data set on epilepsy in Ghana, if you publish your metadata and they are searchable and machine readable, I can know, oh yeah, researcher X in Africa has this data on epilepsy. And then they can reach out if you've not shared the individual level data, at least they can find your metadata and know how best to collaborate and, and use it for different, um, of course, with the right permission to use your um, metadata. So data, again, is exactly, data is what we know, like is information, but metadata are the attributes that describe the relevant information. Uh, data may be informative, but metadata is always informative because it describes the data and the actual data might not be processed, but meta, metadata is always processed. And it's in the database management systems, data is stored as a file, but the metadata is always stored as a dictionary. And then uh, you can use many of the different uh, data sets in the future. However, metadata is always remains a supportive document. It's always something that is describing that data set. And if we were to give you an example of what data looks like and what metadata looks like, this is imagine this as an Excel sheet. The top row is always your metadata and the different rows are your types of data. So if we are to make data fair, the principles are make the metadata primarily and the individual level data fair. At least one of them should be uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And they are really uh, embodied in a set of principles that guide fair. You can read more about them, but they're aimed to promote data sharing and reuse within and between domains, between health and education, health and, and you know the finance sector. You can make all kinds of meta and individual level data fair because they allow ideas and concepts to be easily communicated. They should be machine actionable, particularly the metadata. Uh, they help you work with larger data sets. They support uh, multi-domain research, cross-cutting research. For example, you can imagine all these UN sustainable development data out there. If you merge them, you can have a, a bigger data set to, to work with. And then uh, just to note that the key principle to FAIR is the metadata. At least the metadata has to be published and um, out there and machine searchable. So in terms of the different attributes, and again, most of this information is put out there, but again, in Africa, we find only, there was a study that was done three years ago, only 1% of data in LMICs, or at least in Africa, is findable. But it's our, it's our call to really uh, make sure that we embark on making our data shareable within your institution, within your country, if you don't want to go beyond your 
uh, institution, but at least in the different settings, the different African regions, to make sure that we start to make our data findable, to address questions that are, um, are pertinent in the in the African context. So you know, the metadata assigned a global unique identifier, and all these are different aspects. They are described with rich metadata. That is all attributes of data being findable. They are registered and indexed and searchable, and they can uh, specify a data indicator. So that is the four attributes of findable. There is accessible, accessibility of the data. They can be retrieved by that identifier. They can be put in a common communications protocol. The protocol is open, free, and universally, universally implementable. They allow for authorization and they're accessible. That, those are four attributes and they are different tools to help you make all this attributable, all your data accessible with the different tools out there. Then interoperable, uh, they use a formal accessible shared and broadly applicable language. They use vocabularies that follow FAIR. For example, some of these uh, vocabularies out there, the Athena, the, the different OMOP uh, vocabularies under OMOP are all available and making sure that you can actually map your data to international standards and they are findable and they can be used with different settings. And then lastly, they should be reusable. And again, if you want to know about these, you should create licenses that provide, uh, that go with this data, different types of licenses that are out there to promote, uh, to promote uh, different use from different uh, communities that access your data. So that's just about the fair. Just to note that there are different organizations out there that are promoting FAIR. You can search about them. There is GoFAIR, Research Data Alliance, CODATA, that is Community of Data. It's really focusing a lot of work on making data. There's a FAIR Impact Project. There's a, a European Open Science Cloud. There are now platforms also in Africa, that, like the Ilwazi in South Africa, that are promoting most of these uh, data being findable in Africa. And all of these are operating under two broad uh, protocols. You need to work with fair implementation profiles and also objects that, um, that can describe your data. So I think I'll stop there in the interest of time and questions, I know we've hit the hour, but just to promote, just to let you know that the whole field of making data fair is growing and it's not only in the health sector, but cross domain, uh, verification of data. This is a very big uh, project that's going on right now that we contribute to under the Inspire and network that I mentioned earlier. We are contributing to making data from population health findable, but there's a lot of data coming in from chemistry, from culture, from disaster, ocean science, agriculture, because we need to make all this data findable and you know come up with solutions that are multi-domain and cross-sectional if we are to use more data and come up with interventions that are going to solve many challenges. So I'll stop here for now and I welcome any burning questions as we stop the, uh, the course, the lecture. Sorry, I had to rush a bit, but I hope that the overarching message of standardizing and making your data findable at least is what I wanted to pass on. You can always go down or reach out to me if you need more information around uh, how to go down into the details of standardizing data. We do run some courses on this. I think we do um, online courses of introduction to OMOP, creating ETLs, uh, how do you standardize data? And we are doing this uh, across different institutions. But just to introduce the whole uh, topic of making your data standardized, and findable. And of course, the arguments out there is that do you share actual data or do you share just the knowledge from your data? Is your data safe? But I think as the continent of people in LMIC is at least within the settings, it's time for us to share data, make it accessible, and uh, come up with collaborative projects that make this data usable. So uh, I'll stop there and uh, look at the chat. How can we find, um, yes, I'll share the slides. How can we find those online courses? Uh, if you, I don't know if I have our Inspire. Most of these aspects are out there, but our courses are on inspirenetwork.org. We do, we do some um, online courses for different cohorts, but I can reach out through the team here if there is need to 
uh, .net if there's need to have a separate uh, separate course for this. But most of this information, once I see the other slides, you find a lot of information out there on standardizing data. If you searched uh, standardizing data, making common data models, all this information is out there, and you can uh, you can <coughs> you can find simple tools to help you go through some of these processes. Uh, how can we? Uh, how can we make our data like? How can we make our data like metadata? Can we do it at low level or only applicable? You no, know, any date, any data set has to have a metadata. Think of it as an Excel, an Excel uh, sheet. You always have that top row that describes your data. That is what we call metadata. But you can create a digital, uh, uh, and there are different. There's like you can register this metadata in different platforms. There's something called schema.org where you go in and register your metadata. And if somebody searches, there are Google searches out there that are specific to data sets, they'll find your metadata. And if somebody needs a collaborative research, they can actually find out, find out from you because you put your metadata out there. That, that the second level of making your actual data fair is evolving because again, like you say, different data protection, different countries uh, don't allow data being, you know, crossing the boundaries of the country. But there are different uh, aspects now of making this data findable, at least within your institution. You can use a synthetic copy of your data, create all this code, and then restrict the real world data in your institution, but be able to share aggregates from the data and not the raw data. So there are different permutations of standardizing data, sharing data, and the world is really evolving. There's a lot of uh, environments called federated platforms or trusted uh, trusted environments where people create this, uh, you know, this platform and data is, 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 is safely and soundly shared with different collaborators. So that field is growing, but it's something I wanted to introduce you to as people who are data actors, most times you're the custodians of the data, you're working with researchers, and you need to know the skill sets. How do you create metadata? How do you create a DOI? What are the licenses that should go with these data sets? the licenses from the products that you generate as you support the whole data use in, uh, in the different countries. Uh, I see a question from Esther. How does the process of standardization take into account? Uh, okay, take into account different study objectives and contextual differences among study sites. Yes, Esther, so the ETL process that you create if you saw me talking about the ETL, it's based on a use case. If we've all decided to, to do a study on the effect of drug X on epilepsy, we then create, extract and transload that data based on that use question. It's not a blanket, get your data, put it out there for some of these collaborative researches. It needs to be driven by a, a research objective and you standardize the variables that you need. And then those are what you extract, that's what you transform, and that's what you load. Of course, there will be different uh, contextual differences uh, where the data was collected. But this, if the variables, if you all collected the variables and you can be mapped to the different, um, to the OMOP, which is the blueprint for the, um, uh, the, the Odyssey common data model, then you can, you can map your variables to that blueprint. What you don't have, you'll always leave out. But this can only be done practically. I, I, I just wanted this session to introduce you to standardization, but there's a whole probably two months course on how do you do this? How do you map the data? How do you standardize it? How do you then analyze after you have translated this data? And it's, and it's something that we can always um, continue to discuss, but just to know that it's driven by a research question, by the cohort that you want to develop, and uh, and 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 the questions that you want to 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 to, to address with the question that and the, the outcome that you want to address with the data set that you've collected, do the DHIS program data sets repository pass on standardized data? Uh, they have. I think I would call those as 
harmonized in a way. So there's harmonizing where we all go and collect our variables in, in a particular format. It's like you have a study where you have all collected uh, different variables and agreed we are going to name them. You have this naming convention. Those are harmonized data sets, but in terms of standardizing them, some are, but I, they are more harmonized than standardized, I would say. I uh, can remember uh, that we have a Google form, that's fine. Thank you, got it. Great presentation is really great. We are considering data standardization and sharing data has been expensive. LMICs and custodians almost seems to be reluctant. I think that's a good question, Richmond. What I have to say is that we have to change the narratives of data sharing. The, with federated platforms, you stay with the custody of your data. You can choose what to share. You can choose to share only aggregates from your data, but share something. I think that's what I wanted us to get today. Share within the confines. If you can share hospital level data, imagine if all the health people with digital records are harmonized, that would be a huge resource for data science to inform maybe predictive modeling in Ghana because you already have digital records. You can harmonize them through these common data models, have a large data set that data scientists and modelers and mathematicians can use to predict different outcomes for the country. So different aspects of sharing, some of the sharing happens on site. You can create your model. You can create your instances only at uh, your institution level, or you can create uh, with a server in-house, or you can create and share this data over the cloud. So there's a lot of diversity in sharing data, but we just need to introduce you to the subject and be advocates for uh, data sharing. Any other question? If none, Kevin, I hand over back to you. Uh, no, I didn't really have an ass. I, no, I, I don't, I didn't, sorry, I can see Kevin. No, I don't have an assignment. I thought that this lecture is really introductory. But uh, I can come up with with one if need to. But I I I I wanted to just this to introduce you to different aspects of um, uh, of any of any uh, of that. I think for me the take home from this lesson is the rationale for data science, its application to public health in LMICs, not necessarily Africa, the need to standardize, and how do we make data fair. If if the if everybody here can at least be an advocate for that in your next in your career, it will be. I I don't need to do an assignment, but I think it's something that I want to introduce to you. And moving forward, know that there's value in sharing data, standardizing, and creating large data sets for collaborative analysis within LMICs. If we are to embark on data science as a tool to to change livelihoods. So I won't give an assignment, but I hope that the lecture was helpful and that you've learned something and that uh, you will be advocates for increased data use for uh, in your different aspects, in your different careers. Thank you. I have a question, can I ask? Yes, please. I want to ask like uh, uh, in schedule, we have some resources right, in which uh, one is article and other is related to books, uh, related to data, data sciences. So from where we can download it or uh, uh, get those resources that are sharing in that schedule? I, I think I missed, you talked about resources for sharing these different yeah. Yeah, I'm asking about the resources that, uh, okay. uh, that they are, uh, you can say, we have in see. our schedule. Okay. Okay, I get it. So I'm going to download a couple of resources to get you introduced to harmonizing and standardizing and making data fair. I'm going to pass them through uh, Kelvin so that you can read more, 
and uh yes and and take 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 that feed wherever you are. i'll share this just with kelvin yeah okay thank you so much you're welcome all right thank you i wish you all the best in your next five weeks and enjoy the course please stay on and uh make the best use of the opportunity bye bye and take care Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thank you much. much. Thank you so much. Bye. Okay. Bye. Uh